Okay. Hey, we're a little early. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Wait, are we early? I thought we started at 1.30. Well, I mean, we're early in the sense that the other guys aren't ready. Oh, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're less we're, late. We beat them. <laughs> How you doing, Brian? Uh, good, man. Uh, you'll never guess what I did today unless you follow me on social media. What by did the you way, do today? By the way, it's uh, for the record, it's not a humble brag when you post a press release about how you ran a half marathon. That's it's just, just straight just up bragging. bragging, and that's fine. That's fine. It's like, no, I'm really proud that I did this thing. Sure. Allow me to announce how proud I am of it. Sure, I don't know that that's better than. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, no, humble brag is is uh, I don't know. That's 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 annoying because it's like, you know, there there's some you think you're being clever and it's like, come on, man, we're not fooled. You're just bragging. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, we started a little bit late. Um, Andrew has got some uh, <laughs> construction happening, I guess, outside his outside his apartment. Yeah, I'm trying to try to tie a narrative of why all of us have something weird going on. Because Justin's got a heart out, right? Because he's got a hotline. <clears throat> I've got a I've got a hotline medical, um, not emergency. I'm gonna I'm gonna get my my knuckle looked at. Yeah. Because it's like the skin is all healed up real nice from that drone thing, but there's some under under the skin subcutaneous scar. There's like a little nodule that. It, do you th- do you think they're gonna cut it out, or do you th- or my mom was saying. That she thinks they'll just inject it uh, with some magical potion that'll that'll break up the oh, scar. Oh, something to shrink or break yeah. it up. Oh, I don't know. Like a cortisone shot or something. Maybe, but that would still be just flesh. It would be stronger flesh because it's it's healed up new flesh. Maybe they'll inject me with flesh-eating bacteria. But just a little bit. Right. <laughs> well, and actually, just one or two. They're like they're like uh, <laughs> they're not very hungry. <laughs> like they've already sure. uh, just after they're Thanksgiving. They're flesh nibbling <laughs> yeah, bacteria. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they stopped at like, Starbucks like, before oh, they got more? I don't know. This is kind of. <laughs> I like the tough stuff. Give me that uh, <laughs> that scar tissue. Um, yum, 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 yum. All right, let's give these jokers a call and see who up. Who up? Smash that like. Smash that like. Smash that like. Oh, damn. Oh! Hello. Yo, give me two seconds. Okay. Welcome to Weird Things in My Bedroom. Yeah, welcome to Weird Bedroom featuring your partner in crime, Andrew Maine. Hey, Andrew. Um, uh, so, uh... Oh, uh, hey, Andrew, I was able to snag a, a super important last-minute um, uh, doctor's appointment. So my heart out uh, is I, I may have to bolt on after things, uh, but I have okay. to I have to be there. Uh, so I'm probably gonna have to leave at three fifteen, or maybe even a little bit before, if that works. It's one fifteen um, for you West Coasters. Yeah, one fifteen. Yeah, sure, whatever. We don't need you. Ah, I knew it. Got yeah, you. ironically, I'm, I'm I I go in and I ask like, hey, I'm playing this like role playing game and I've lost a hand. Uh, is there? Can you grow me a new hand? <laughs> Hey, Justin. <laughs> Yo, happy birthday, dude. Thank you. Thank you very much. We went out Hello. on Friday night after after the Yanni Donna show and hung out. Oh, did you have and a good time? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We went uh, we went to Charlie's and they were doing some uh, album release party, so there were a bunch of rock bands out there playing their mostly good music. <laughs> <laughs> Mike TV and I actually like really bonded uh, talking shit about the last band of the night. Yeah. Uh, which was the band that was releasing the album. Um, I I need to save all of it, but Justin, uh, like, I, I won't talk about it till Night Attack, but uh, did you hear how our Auntie Donna viewing went? Uh, I, I've only followed what I saw on, on Facebook. Okay, well, so you know that, uh, that, that one of our tribe happened to be front and center. In the oh, front row yeah. center seat, much, much much like it was at at, at my show, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. So we'll talk about all that. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, it's so good. It's so amazing. Yeah. No, Leon, the 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 archivist. Leon was. Uh, yeah. It was Leon. Leon was Larry. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. <laughs> But it wasn't just the front row center person who was a diamond clubber. No, yeah, I, I definitely got pulled on stage by by Broden. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I that I did not. Uh, I, I didn't place where where in the show that would have been. So I'm excited uh, to hear about that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the character that has debuted to mixed reviews. 
Oh, oh, <laughs> Lord Whoopi. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> That's such a great bit because I didn't under I didn't get it until the very end. It's like, oh, Whoopi. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, as much as I want to talk about things, I have no reference to at all. Yeah, yeah. Brian does have to go see about his hormone replacement procedure. I'm growing a new hand, I told you. Mm, that's what they call it now. I'm um, committed to the bit. I all just right. need another minute. Um, trying to figure out audio stuff. Did you, uh, uh, yeah, dude, I uh, hit rank six in Hearthstone. That's the best I've ever done. Uh, dude, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm st I still think of the comment we got about uh, listening to a bunch of guys who play Hearthstone talking about gaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like I'm mean, like my mom. It would be like my mom and I. Like I mean, it's not exactly my mom and I. Like you know, we're going to talk about Jay Z's latest album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny because you know, I uh, and I think we talked about it. Like I can feel my uh, my hardcore game knowledge atrophying uh, with uh, you know over the past few years. Well, that's just it. It's like, because then it's like you kind of find what you like and whatnot. Because, like, I like music and stuff. And I know some things I know a lot of, but a lot of things I don't. If I talk to somebody who knows a lot about music, I'm like, there's a lot out there, <laughs> you know? And then what's big to other people, you're like, mm. I dated a girl that was like, you know, in the music scene out here. And, you know, I just, oh, yeah, so and so this producer there, so and so. I'm like, I, oh, he did this, I did this. I'm like, oh, I know the music, but I just didn't know. Yeah. It's well, like it, when you first hear people talk about directors, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and it's like uh, like uh, so much of the music, like I don't know the titles or who sings it. Mm -hmm. I just know it tends to show up on this Pandora list. Or, or yeah. Someone. Hey, there's yeah. something I think it sounds like it's rubbing on the mic. Or yeah, things. it's getting my microphone. All right, let's try. Is that better? Uh, keep, talk to or us. Or worse, I'll keep talking. What's that? Talk, talk to us a little bit. Talk, talk to us. I'm going to keep talking. This is going to be my voice coming out of my mouth hole as I talk to you and we talk about me talking, talking, talking. No, I like um, the headphones better. I know it's a little clicky. All right. But let me try to figure out a way because it, it just, I don't have, there's no hard surface in here, so to speak. So it's, I'd be, it's hard. <laughs> the headphones rubbing against here. Yeah. And they're back out front. But if I lean forward. Let me, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. I did it. I didn't know I'd wake up to a jackhammer outside. Yeah, I wake up sometimes You're and up. they're, they're pressure washing the, the hallways outside oh, of my apartment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, cause it's in the middle of the day yeah. when no one is there. Except me. You're like, yeah, what, you what they're doing is they're replacing, like, we had, we had like a weird infection in our pool and the whole pool was, was like blocked off Ooh. and it looked like yellow tape and it looked like a murder scene and so they're replacing the pool pump oh jeez and i and i heard it they, they stopped and i go outside they're just eating their like their pie or whatever <laughs> um, okay can 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 i can you call me right back i just want to make sure because there's been a lot of uh, switches and, and changes so i'm gonna i'm gonna call you right back andrew okay bye okay oh finally got rid of that dead weight finally weird things could be the show that it was always meant to be more Night things, attack. less weird. Night attack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there he is. Look at that. Look at that face. I had to edit a video last night I shot five years ago. Oh, wow. What's that like? Humbling? Uh, <laughs> strangely, I couldn't tell some of the shots when they were done. You, 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 strangely what? I couldn't tell when some of the shots were done, if they were recent or not. That was the funny I mean, what, thing, because I mean, of the lighting. I had, like, but... But I can see the difference. It's so full of youthful hope. <laughs> it's like it's like the face is the same, but the eyes. See, these yeah, are oh, recent. Yeah. These are dead inside. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a magic video. And so I had this pinky tell. Whenever I whenever I teach something and I'd show I hide something, my pinky would always stick out. Oh, that's so funny. You know, if I normally do it, I wouldn't do it. But when I was doing tutorials, I noticed this. I'm like, that's that's a funny. And I don't do that to more anymore. I think, but that was a funny little quirk. All right, I think I'm ready to go now, guys. You Beautiful. guys good to go? <clears throat> yep. All right, well then, uh, take it away in three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, broadcasting from my bedroom, which would mean it's weird things in the bedroom, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. How are you? And Brian 
Brushwood. Are you sure this isn't Weird Things After Dark, where things get a little steamy in Andrew's bedroom? Dude, I'm not saying it couldn't be. Uh, <laughs> they're actually they're using a jackhammer like 10 feet from my door out front, so I figured I'd come back here and record from here unless we wanted the sound of I don't know. the part jackhammer. Of, part of me would love a whole Weird Things episode just interrupted every five minutes with Andrew saying, Damn it! Damn it! Shut up! <laughs> it's, it's like... Well, it's like when you start podcasting, and you first have kids. Go back and look at when you first had to figure out how to wrangle children while doing that. Uh, yeah, no, it's yeah. Uh, it continues to be a, a chaotic vector of over which I have little to no control. But you don't. You're better managing that now. Oh yeah, uh, it's called. Yeah, yeah. We got a very good lock and a very soundproof <laughs> door, <laughs> and some child sized straight jackets. <laughs> That's right. Uh. Gentlemen, it's all about convenience. And previously on an episode of Weird Things, we were waxing on about the potential of a self-driving future and the idea that it's not just about cars. It's not just the idea of, well, now I get into a car and my car's a Johnny Cab and it takes me where I want to go. What happens when you have things that move around by themselves using roads and whatnot? What happens in a world where you can get things from point A to point B without having to pay for a truck driver, without having to wait for a human schedule, when things just sort of happened by themselves, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the examples that I just found today, which was really, really cool, like, first I want to get into the idea of, like, the automation of the future, right? Amazon Go is a project where they're trying to develop a supermarket or a store that's completely automated. You walk in there, put whatever you want in your bag, and walk out, and it uses RFID or whatever to tell what you bought, which is, you know, something we thought about for a while. But there's another concept, which is cool, which is sort of right out of the pages of weird things that they thought on this way before. And this is from a company called Wheelies, which is launching a test project of what they call the Moby Mart. What is the Moby Mart, I ask? The Moby Mart is a large autonomous store. Oh, okay. my word. Yeah. This is like so a Bryce... taco truck grocery store where <laughs> where where you just you schedule it. Oh my word. So we're looking at like something about the size of the shipping container. It's got a big glass front and then it looks like a red box attached to it, but inside there's somebody looking through a bunch of just bunch of red products. And it's something they plan to test out where it's a store that could theoretically go to a warehouse, get refilled, then drive to a location and just park there. That's amazing. Well, and plus, like, uh, you would just want to know, like, basically, I, I, man, apps change everything because you can open up the app a la Lyft and Uber and, and you're thinking, like, I need stuff. And you can open the app and it'll say stuff will be less than a mile away from you uh, in in 30 minutes or or currently is just down the street from you. And then, uh, and, oh, man, that's that's astonishing. I'll give you give you a thing to think about. So. Where I live in my apartment complex, every Thursday, the uh, people who run the place, they bring in a, a food truck. They have a food truck. So Thursday night's food truck night. I've noticed that several other times a week, food trucks will show up because they realize, you know what? It's a densely packed area. There's a lot of like college students and stuff that don't have transportation. And there'll be another food truck there. Sometimes there's one across the street. And you think about like now food truck roundups have become a big deal. But you think about the idea of, hey, you know what? Um, you know, there's going to be the convenience store is going to be at the corner tonight at 7 p.m. Yeah. Well, I you mean, know, it, I, it really makes you rethink all of retail space, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the idea of, you know, food trucks, uh, food trucks got popular because even the staffing and, and purchase of that equipment is more mobile and modular than the idea of, of buying real estate and and now you're betting that the 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 traffic that you're going to get will sustain your business here you can move easily the biggest reason why restaurants go under is not the quality of the food or the service it's the fact that it's just in the wrong place and mm -hmm. for a mobile mart you know you can now do some really really cool data analytics on like just where do people need random stuff Right. Like wh wh at what point do consumers like to go buy a random thing? And now it can just be on a uh, a, a regular schedule. So it's closer to, you know, uh, places where people go to sleep, you know, like they're, they're the suburbs during the night and downtown during the day. 
You know, it's uh, the only we're thing watching that... video rendering of this thing driving through. I'm sorry, just, they're watching a video of this thing driving through at night. It's lit up like neon. It's a little eerie and Blade Runner esque. It um, is. Yeah, no, I... it, it looks it looks you know <laughs> you know it, it, in that way that the future can be both uh, hopeful, exciting, and also terrifying and dystopic. Like this is both. Yeah, it's a uh, you know the only I'm looking at this and I, here's what I honestly wonder. Um, like in the rendering that we're seeing here, we're seeing, you know, shoes and, and all kinds of, uh, uh, higher end goods, but I don't think you're going to be able to do much more than what you would find at a convenience store, right? It, it would well, just have to be the, the, the essential 200 sundries. Think, think about, think about this though. Okay. So you get food trucks and then food trucks are great cause they have that variety. And one of the things that's been kind of really cool is that, uh, in Portland, uh, I visited a girl there and she lived right right down at the end of her block was this lot that had like five or six different food trucks, right? And as much variety as you could hope for in a mall shopping cart, but it was all food trucks that were there permanently. I mean, they could move when they wanted to. In Fort Lauderdale, uh, I don't know if you ever saw this, Justin, there was a part downtown by the beach where there was another lot that they put like green, you know, AstroTurf in there. And they had a couple other like food trucks and tables and stuff. And it was like a little mini restaurant thing. You can do specialty stores and stuff. And think about back in the day when you had the Tupperware party or you had somebody, the specialty sort of stuff shows up. That might be kind of a thing like like you say, hey, you know what? I have a company. and What we do is we bring in exotic teas from around the world and we actually have a tea store and we're going to have the tea stores going to be in Santa Monica on Monday. It's going to be in, you know, Homeby Hills on Tuesday or whatever. And the idea that, you, oh, I know they're going to be here on Tuesday. The, the tea store will be there and it gives you. As much as we have online shopping, we're finding there is a place for still wanting to go look and browse. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I think shoes would actually be a fantastic version of this. Imagine like Zappos runs with this. Mm -hmm. And then it's like uh, Zappos looks at your order history and says, okay, in general, you like Vans. It's been a while since you replaced your dress shoes. You know, it, it, it knows enough about you that it's that that the app pipes up and says, hey, this time will remind you when it gets closer. But but w if we were there Tuesday afternoon, would you would you want to take a look for new shoes? I mean, it could do predictive like, you know, you heard the story about how Amazon on their delivery trucks always keeps like uh, like one high end, like, you know, Mark, you know, Canon Mark five, whatever, like the lightest big camera was. You mm -hmm. heard about this? No, no. They they did their logistics and they knew in cities like San Francisco at any given time on any one of their trucks, there's always going to be one of those cameras because they know they're going to sell at least one or two of those per day. Mm -hmm. So they can get it to you in an hour because it's already on the truck because they know that it moves. So you could do your Zappos model, which could and it could even be more like because the problem is trying to get people to decide in advance. Mike, because then I might as well just order it. But you could be predictive and say, well, we know Brian's sh shoe size. And so we know if Brian gets here and he'll know that it's in here. He'll want it. But you could also do Nike. Nike could do like, hey, we could have a Nike fleet of tenities and we could do Nike pop up shops. Where, you know, I was on a, in, you know, I was in a, out in a Melrose where it's a big shopping district there. And you see these shoe stores and stuff and these specialty shops, these pop up. They get lines going on for a block because people oh, yeah. want to get the exclusives. Well, and, well and, and, and and you look at uh, uh, the proliferation of, of pop up shops for like music and movies and mm -hmm. celebrities, like uh, to to run limited fashion lines. Like uh, I, I could see, obviously, I think this is the play for these people uh, now because they're going to sell their own. They can buy stuff that are good margins, and you can just kind of use it as a mobile modular CVS. So you're going to buy all the same stuff, and that. or you just use uh, use it as empty warehouse space, right? Like mm -hmm. if it's all fully customizable, then you know I think uh, I saw people on Twitter talking about you know two chains did a thing in I forget where I assume it's L.A., but it was like a, a salon, a trap music salon where they were you know uh, giving manicures and pedicures and selling like you know pretty girls like trap music, um, uh, t-shirts and stuff like that. So like why not uh uh like why why uh just go for empty uh space and office space like why not have it be something where you're zooming all over the city I I'll give you an even crazier thought so Brian imagine you rented one of these this and made it the scam stuff mobile and it had all the scam stuff kind of thing and there's a kiosk there and it's like hey we've got elimination stuff and it's going to be in to be in Austin for one day it's going to be in LA for another and, you know, stop on by. I'll be there live on video chatting with you or whatever. 
Dude, that's the crazy part is because then what happens like so right now we're seeing the the front end of this where you have uh, wealthy mega companies that are able to invest in the infrastructure or whatever. At some point, there's going to be a a portable pop up shop for everyone's service that basically. Uh, just like Squarespace makes it easy for everyone to make a website, this would make it easy for anyone to have a pop-up store where it's like uh, like all the inventory for scam stuff is already at a facility in Atlanta right now. So basically, they could reach out to me and say, hey, you want to set up a tour? You don't even have to lift a finger. We've got the truck. We've got your stuff. We'll take it out. All we need you to do is to pick a theme and maybe maybe even like all the decorations are all video based so it's just oh. like just paint it in the color scheme using the graphics you want we'll brand it we'll logify it and it's like we're we're uh you know you set up your tour and or we'll give you the dates that you can set up x y and z and uh man that really could think, be think think about this you're like hey vidcon or hey there's a magic convention or hey yeah there's going to be nab man you know i bet you if i put a scam school pop-up mobile pop-up there and it's like because you're getting rid of the human cost and you could show up through whatever that's the big factor here so much of these costs are somebody to stock it somebody to do this but if you put that into that thing you think about like that it could be a you know oh it's going to have it be a nerdtacular you know we're going to be doing this event at dragon con and so why don't i can put it all my specialty merchandise and stuff and just oh my when God. it's not there and i'll tell you what that's a great example too because dragon con the first couple of years we came i i brought a trailer full of merch and we sold a lot of stuff but it was a tremendous pain in the butt uh just unbelievable so much so that at some point both justin and i decided you know what, Dragon Con's going to be a, a goodwill tour. Like, we're, <laughs> we're just out here to show up and say hi to the fans. And meanwhile, like, I'm sure the fans would love custom shirts and all that stuff. But 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 it's the logistics of getting it there are just so much that, that it's, not, it's not really worth doing. Man, but you think about it is one of those concert tours, things like that, you know, the, the, the band merge. I mean, guys, I think we quit the podcast and we just start our mobile mark cast and actually start our company to do this. <laughs> and in fact, we can live in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I want to bring up a point of why, you know, it's even as we move in this increasingly online world and even as we start doing more and more there, we all sort of, I think everybody appreciates the value of being able to do some things in purpose on in, in person, browsing, things like that. Browsing is problematic for stores where you just browse and you go buy it online, but we still like to go look at things and we still love to go to events. And I'll give you an example of something that was really kind of amazing was uh, I went to an event a couple days ago that was announced only like two days before and i'm going to show you a photo of the crowd oh that's a monstrous crowd that looks uh, like a concert is happening yeah there was i don't know what the estimate was and i don't know if anybody knew because i don't think anybody realized how many were there but it was you know i would say it was probably in the tens of thousands of people showed up for this event um and it was organized two days before it was announced and then that was what the turnout was now, the unfortunate circumstance of the event was it was about the, cel the the passing of Adam West and celebrating his life, you know, TV's Batman. Because what this was, was at downtown city of Los Angeles, in honor of Adam West, they lit up the bat signal on City Hall. The old the old 1960s one, too. Yeah, the, t the one from his TV show. So that was a really cool tribute that they did for there. And But it was just, you look at this, and how many people showed up? It was incredible. Um, which I was there going like, yeah, we still want to get, we still want to do things in person. We still want to go someplace live. That's why cons are bigger now than they've ever been before. And I think the idea of figuring out how you combine like retail, you know, online you know, distribution with new technology, and, you know, you start thinking like, yeah, these mobile shops and stuff, it's going to be a very different paradigm. Well, and plus, like, I think about this, like there, I can picture a scenario where it's, cheap enough let's say in a 3d printing world where autonomous vehicles uh are there um that it might be worth it to 3d print out four or five shoes custom fit to me just for the off chance that i might pick one of them to buy and if i don't then the the rest just get chopped up and recycled they get rendered down into their constituent parts and then sent off to somewhere else it might it might be, you know, and here's the this from The Verge had a very pessimistic response to this. And within it, it was there was a thing here. I'm like, oh, I think you just missed this. And their response, their final thing was a mobile store could possibly help serve underdeveloped urban areas with limited access to quality food or basic necessities. But it frankly feels like an idea that's best suited as a prop in a sci fi movie. Now, let's back that up. 
farmers markets. Imagine you and Justin get married, go off to you know some uh, little uh, co-op somewhere, and you start your own little garden, your your own little farmers market, your own little farm, right? Yep. Imagine sure. your ability to do farm to table. Yeah. Pack your stuff, put it in your little mobile thing. It shows up at the farmers market, and that alone, I think, I think the hipster support for this alone is a trillion dollar economy. Yeah, and and I'll not lie, you know, this whole packaging kind of kind of screams novelty. It feels a little Tomorrowland, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's got all the right buzzwords. It's a drone, self driving, automated. What else is in mm -hmm. the headlines? Uh, you know, solar power, all that stuff. But uh, everything looks ridiculous uh, at first, and then We're it just becomes live normal video life. Of thing, the real thing, actually driving around a campus. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I think that the I think this is this is something that could very well take off. You know, I mean, uh, the why why I, I, do we feel that we have totally solved where I get my toothpaste? Right. You know, mm -hmm. do, do we do we feel like we've totally solved why we need to go to a mini mart, like even in a world where, you know, uh, I would say the three of us are probably on the far end of taking advantage of e-commerce and Amazon and stuff like that. I still wind up going to a CVS, you know, over 10, 15 times a year, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, and, I think that if if I knew that, a, I got a notification that. Uh, I hate to go buy clothes because I'm a dude, but if I got a notification that said, hey, you know, the, the John Vervedo store is at the end of the block, I'm yeah. going to go there. A high chance I'll probably buy something. You know, I mean, it's it just that that I think about, like, the specialty kind of stuff, the kind of stuff of, like, there is that. I I think there's just, yeah, I think there's a lot. But, yeah, the idea that could be you know, from the Cuban store, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very bullish on this. Well, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, why do we – go to CVS. Like, why do we go to do these places? Because they buy good real estate and mm -hmm. make good, clean shopping experiences. If you have a good, clean shopping experience that doesn't have to have the, the real estate to it and can go where you are going to be because it understands traffic patterns, why wouldn't it be successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I go for a nightly walk and I, it's, it's four miles one way, four miles back. I passed four 7-Elevens. Yeah. You know, easily, easily. And most of those are in the first two miles. I mean, it's just, and, and you see the density. And then it's, uh, what's the Dwayne, whatever, Reader, whatever, in New York City. It's like every block has one of those. And so we see that there is that need for that. So. It's so uh, it's so interesting to me how much uh, uh, Neil Stephenson's book Snow Crash got right uh, for all the wrong reasons. Like so much of the imagery he had in there, uh, you know, it was it was written as uh, clearly meant to be a dystopian future with anarcho capitalism run amok to where you know the United States government is just a small lesser brand among others. Everything else is run by franchises, and you you get uh, actual legal citizenship to to like a, a pizza franchise or whatever, and, and, mm -hmm. and they have their own currency and everything. And yet so much of the imagery and so much of the 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 practical realities of it are are coming to pass. And it's just because uh, on top of all the infrastructure that existed in, in the early 90s when this was written, there's this, uh, you know, this 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 second economy exploding over it of abundance, you know, his his vision of of um oh i forgot what he called it the metaverse i think he called it um mm -hmm. was uh, essentially is all coming to pass and and it's and it's wonderful and diseases you know being cured and and people have more of everything and you know it's it's, it's weird for 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 so many things that were clearly meant to tell a pessimistic tale it's awesome to see how many of them are coming to pass in a very positive light i have a theory on this and that is that Progress brings solution, but progress brings complexity. And the more complexity you have, the more problems you have. But they're much smaller scale problems. It's like, Absolutely. Uh, where's my remote control to my TV? <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, I spent 10 minutes looking for that. Like, you have a magic little device that controls this TV that has hundreds of channels here. And your frustration was, I yeah, couldn't find the remote. You know, like, ah, I couldn't get this app to download on my phone. Urgh. You know, you think about all those mini little frustrations. And it's part of why we become, you listen You, you listen to some of these, like, some of these tech columnists do some of their pests. Like here, it's like, even on the mobile mart thing, like, ah, it's maybe for this niche kind of thing. And it's also like this 
this the, this commercialization of things, which I agree that we're a commercialized culture. But once the first Neanderthal made some shiny little thing and said, ah, you, you, "You like that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. How many <laughs> fish hooks do you got?" <laughs> you know. Uh, there, there, there oh, really yeah, is something uh, the, the, primal that that we're that we're forever going to be trying to satisfy. Uh, only we're just going to do it in in, in increasingly uh, efficient ways. Yeah, these are deer tribe rocks, by the way, guys. Deer tribe rocks. Oh my god, not, I, you can't not, get those anywhere. Yeah, not the bare woods ones. Those guys, those guys suck. <laughs> <It's, you know? laughs> these are these are these are fully rock to table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like you think like, man, we want to get back to away from this commercialization or whatever. But you need to look at the illustrations or photos of indigenous peoples and stuff, and it's feathers and an ornamentation and everything. You know, it's 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 facial, you know, tattoos and all it's all that sort of stuff. Like, yeah, no, it's a thing. It's just it's just a thing we do. It's a thing we do. Um, or we go broke building things like, uh, you know, Easter Island. You know, <laughs> JC Calhoun, Calhoun's uh, in the chat saying, uh, "Oh, these are artisanal bespoke rocks." Ooh. <laughs> um, now, you, now you got my language. Hey, you know what's also, also artisanal and bespoke? Oh, well, that would be the Patreon for uh, Weird Things. Patreon.com slash Weird Things. Heck yeah, man. You guys keep us on the regular. There was a time, there was dark days when we weren't able to do this show every single week to keep your brains filled with all the weirdest stuff from goblins to 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 fully uh, sentient stores that visit you <laughs> in the future. And that's all made possible for those fantastic folks headed over to patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, we yeah, need your folks. support. Go ahead on over there. We got, uh, we got after shows. We got uh, uh, the uh, after things podcast, of course, which is your look into the more business side of uh, the, 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 the three of us. And it all takes place because you guys dare to support us and we are so so happy that you do we do we do we we do be happy that you support us <laughs> and talk nice good and stuck nice, words good uh, i've actually been working on the natural language processor thing and that's like made me think about structure and words and how they structure those words uh yeah hey uh brian yeah justin yeah Oh, um, I want you to imagine the three of us were hanging out, right, in person. Right? Yeah, already this sounds improbable. And then one of us is like, hey, later, dude, I'm off. And he was gone. He was gone. Wait, like he that vanished it. in our eyes or he just left? Just drifted away, just sort of drifted off, okay? And then, like, imagine that, like, we're like, let's say, let's say Brian, it's you and I hanging out and all of a sudden Justin drifts away, right? Sure. Okay. I want you to imagine the while later, we're like, man, it was always you and me, right? Just, just us. <laughs> yeah. No, right? that's what I feel. I feel like uh, Justin was just sort of a, a distant memory. Uh, <laughs> by the way, uh, you're describing what uh, what feels like that uh, that Reddit cartoon. It's like four panels long. It's one person handing something to another, and it says, I made this. And then the person says, you made this? And there's one panel of him holding it, and then that the person goes, I made this like a, completely forgetting like all he knows in that moment, like a goldfish discovering the other side of the fishbowl is that he's holding a thing and we're like, well, I must've made this. That's why it's in my hands. So you and I are like, yeah, it's just, just been us. Right. It's always been us. Right. I would imagine. And then, and then, and then like we're hanging out and we look around, I don't know, we're, we're look around. We see other people. We're at like a, you know, a party, but everybody's sort of in groups. And it's, you know, you and I are just there. And then we look over and we see like a three person group over there. We see a three person group over there. We see a three person group over there. Uh oh. I'm like, you know, is it, is it odd? It's just you and I. Is it weird? That, 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 that it, there's not a third person? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, you know, I mean, and then we'd be like, it's a little weird, right? Well, you know? and then. Certain, then, certainly, then in this sample size, it's we we appear to be the only duo in in a in a room full of triplets. Yeah, and we go over, we see, we find we find some other duo, and they're a bit you know younger versions. They're like, hey, hey, yeah, we're finally trying to find a, another duo, and they're like crying, like, well, well, what's up? Why are you guys upset? Well, we were a trio. You were a trio. Yeah, we we lost our buddy. Huh. And then we're trying to think, like, were we ever a trio? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I right? don't remember. All I remember is just the two of us. Yeah, but, you know, it, it would make maybe because maybe like there's some patterns in the way we hang out in the way that we interact, you know, and, and it would be like, man, if there had been a 
third one of us. It might because we don't quite know how maybe how we met or whatever. Okay, so I guess in a moment of self reflection, we'd have to question why we do the things we do. We like like uh, stuff like the order of our conversation. Like, hey, you notice like there's this weird point where you say something, and I say something. And we kind of just wait, and it feels right to wait a while, but nobody says anything before we start again. Exactly. Now I want you to imagine that it wasn't you and me. It was just you, and you're just like, you're the party. And you see, it's instead of duos and trios, it's just single people and duos. And you're looking around, there's all these duos here, and I'm here by myself. Is that, hold on, is this like, whole bit about you looking for a loved one? <laughs> are, you, are you looking to get married? What's going on? Well, Brian, if you're asking. Uh, <laughs> no, Brian. Imagine you're single, and you're in the room, and you see all these other duos there, and maybe a couple trios. And you're like, wow, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a single here. This is kind of weird. And then you talk, and finally you see another single, and they're like, oh, I was a duo once. Maybe I was a triple, but now I'm all but You're like, oh, and I'm older than him, maybe. And then finally, Neil deGrasse Tyson walks in and says, what we're talking about is why is our son by itself? Oh, that's He didn't actually say that. Scientists have been looking at maps of the galaxy and looking at all the other star systems that have two stars or multiple star systems and asking, like, why is our sun by itself? And a prevailing theory is, and it's brought up before, our sun had a twin. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, okay. What was the book? I, you recommended it, and I read it, um, and it was it was it was uh, hauntingly pessimistic, but it made the case that that uh, number one, Earth is very unusual because it only has one moon, and that also that's why life got created mm -hmm. on Earth, and that's why life is rare, is because we have just one moon that's big enough to sweep out uh, uh, stuff that normally resets the life creating button. So, so this sounds like a similar idea, but just with stars, because my guess is in general, life may have a harder time developing on a planet orbiting a binary star system uh, than a single star. There is, I mean, this didn't necessarily get into the idea of what if, uh, about life existing or whatever, but it just got into the idea that like, hey, it would appear like we've talked about the idea that if that if you know Jupiter had been much more massive, that could have been another part of a, a you know a star, and but this gets to the idea like, hey, it would seem it would seems more than likely they think that almost all stars actually start in pairs. The theory is they think that they almost all start in pairs, and then that's one of the an, an essential part of star formation. And then eventually, one of the they just split up. They're like, "Listen, I need my own space. I'm going to go over here, you know, and maybe I'll drift into orbit of another star. Who knows? Can't say what's going to happen or not." Um, and so, there's a lot of things about our solar system. We've tried to figure out, you know, how did this work out? And so, this theory is that, and they've talked about this before, the idea of nemesis which was, is the idea that there could be this far-off distant companion star that sweeps through some point bringing comets and stuff towards Earth and annihilation kills the dinosaurs. This may not be that. This could just be some star that is, because if it left billions of years ago, we may never know which one it is. Somewhere in the sky, we could probably see it. A long-lost twin. And, may have, and, you know, it could would probably have planets, too. Think about that, too, is that there is, more than likely than not, it would have planets, Okay. And the idea that 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 you know there's a we have a twin solar system out there, yeah, not exactly like us. I mean, they'd be like kind of like the twin, like oh, we're twins, like really, you know. So so I I yeah, wonder oh, yeah. I wonder if there's a I I I'm saying I wonder, but I'm assuming that there is some kind of uh, compositional fingerprint of the type of matter that makes up our solar system, and I'll bet you know, in a distant enough future where we've sent probes all over the place that, that we, I wouldn't be surprised if like, just as we, you know, found a layer of iridium that clued us in that, you know, a single rock killed all the dinosaurs. Maybe, maybe a probe will come back and say, Hey, uh, we, out of all the thousands of solar systems we've checked out, none of them are, are quite as close to our compositional fingerprint as this one is. Uh, this is your long lost star. First, an alternative theory. I prefer to think that 65 million years ago, one dinosaur said to the other one, said, all right, I'm ready to turn on our iridium fusion reactor. What could go wrong? <laughs> there is, there is, uh, I, I, apparently I'm king of the Reddit comments, uh, but there was a, there was a cartoon <laughs> that just showed uh, uh, two dinosaurs and then it shows a, a, a shooting star and it says, oh. Hey, oh, it's a shooting star, make a wish. He goes, I wish for more wishes. And then the sky is just filled with, <laughs> with the meteors. Oh, like, <laughs> they're like what did you do <laughs> um so uh 
it is a as far as the, the articles like we're not sure if they, they say that they don't know if they would be able to figure out which one was i think but i think that's the, a scientific answer from our data set that we have right now and i think yes you can look at composition we we would know it might be approximately the same age assuming the ignition point happened here there compositionally probably the same you know if it was the same sort of accretion disk i think that there might be some ways to figure out to like calculate trajectories and stuff i i i'm i'm bullish on the idea that we could probably narrow we would start by narrowing it down by saying we're only looking for stars that we think are of a certain age we're looking at stars that would be within a certain distance frame of when this could have happened but I mean, there could be a billion years, give or take, distance that could be problematic. Well, I and, think it's and, possible. Uh, think think about this aspect. But I'm too. not an astronomer. <laughs> uh, what? And and this is all wild speculation, of course, was just what we're best at. Um, think about this. Uh, like we know, as far as we know, you know, as hard evidence, we're the only life that that ever uh, created. Which means, in our admittedly way too small sample size, um, uh, we know that of all the various configurations of matter that the type in the solar system. Uh, seems to be the most successful at creating life. So if another star system was was you know made up of the same stuff as as we were, then then it seems like I, is that too big of a of a cognitive leap to say that that all things being equal, a star that was once uh, you know made up of the same stuff as our system would be mo a better bet to start looking for life than anywhere else. Yeah, it would. No, I would think so. The thing is that we have. And I don't know how well this works, but you know that we are a product of a stellar nursery. So there are probably hundreds or thousands of stars that were created from sort of the same area, you know, same thing that we were. So I don't know, like, you know, Alpha Centauri, assuming they came from the Sony point, is that like, I don't I don't know how compositionally it differs. You know, it certainly is a different size star and it's a different age and it may afford at a different point there. But I, I don't know. Um, I don't have an answer to that. And I would so I. I could say maybe I don't know maybe, maybe. <laughs> uh, but remember that that is the one thing is we did come from like a nursery of a lot of the same gas and stuff formed a lot of stars. Justin, would you feel any kinship? Like, let's say tomorrow word came out that this was definitely known, and there's one star in the sky that you could point to and say that's our twin star. Would would you or would you even care? Well, like just. The idea of it, yeah. Like, well, I mean, like, uh, like at what level? Like, like get a get a shirt that said like you know same suns dot exe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Put in this context, we get contacted by two aliens at the same time, and one's like, "Yeah, hey, yo, bros, what's up? Warrior bros, long lost." You're like, "Oh, cool." The other one's like, "Yeah." But those guys are jerks, and we need your help because uh, we're at war. You guys got to pick a side. Oh man, family over. <laughs> and so meanwhile, meanwhile, like the uh, uh, the bro ones are are are, are like uh, uh, I don't know your 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 in laws. You know your distant relatives coming up asking. Uh, and they're like, and they're like, we're all made of star stuff. Remember that we're all made of you and I. We're the same. You and I. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like wait, villains always what? do that. I I got a I got a problem with that. You just you show up for the first time, uh, you know, when you've got problems and now you need our help. Like, all right. That seems like some toxic uh, family behavior. OK, but also so, also like one uh, the not the ones that are like us, like they're they're they have bilateral symmetry. They they have arms and legs. They look, you know, kind of proto humanoid. Uh, whereas the other guys, you know, they're, they're just like um, uh, they're octopods, right? They're nothing but beaks and, and, and arms well, and tentacles. I, I'm saying go the other way because no reason the other are our twins would look anything like us. You know, what if they're the octopods and the strangers are like, you know. Oh, oh are, are, like, are like speaking uh, uh, British sounding in English? Well, they just look, you know, like they're like, I'd do that. Yeah. You know. Or what they about this? It. What if? Oh, this is interesting. Uh, okay, no, this is a practical one. Imagine that that there are two alien civilizations, and they they reach out to us, and uh, and one is uh, as 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 we've talked about, you know, uh, as the equivalent of humanity's children, se sentient AI robots that self replicate, and they're totally synthetic. They're like, yeah, no, we had a uh, we had a biological precursor that created us, and now it's all us, and uh, and we are. We are this culture. And then separately, you have uh, a biologically uh, run, you know, I, I don't know, imagine humanity uh, or, or some version of it, you know, millions of years later. Uh, would you feel 
like if you had to pick a side, would you feel beholden to to go for the biological society versus the uh, the artificial one? Brian, the solution's easy. Whoever's doable. <laughs> ten, ten, ten would bang. Ultimately, this is a this is a binary question, right? It's either yep. ones or zeros. Yeah. I hate to reduce it to that, but, you know, just saying. Because if they're not doable, then we're maybe going to come to head over. It's like, it's imagine, all right, if we were writing, like, military fiction in the 1920s, like, military sort of fiction sort of stuff, imagine we're like, hey, you know, the Germans, you know, they may come back. Like, no, 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 we'd be like, no, Germans are, they're pretty resilient people. They're pretty industrious. Like, I could see them, because I, I don't think this war thing's resolved. And they're like, all right. Let's imagine our fictional matchup. Like, who's going to be on Germany's side? Like, okay, well, you know, the Italians, you know, I could see them going in on that, you know. And I could see, you know, uh, Hungary, you know, we could see them going in on that. Like, all right, what if it was a global conflict? All right, what if they paired up with the Japanese? Right. Wait, no, but they're they're really, this version, they're really racist. Oh, yeah, they're super, super, super racist. And they're going to team up with the Japanese. And it, it, just because it's like uh, interests align and, and all of a sudden, uh, yeah. you know, politics, strange bedfellows, all that stuff. So I guess you're right. And then it'd be I, like, <laughs> yeah, and then, if they, and then it's like, well, what would happen afterwards? Which is, you know, man in the high castle sort of deals with that idea of, of you know, like, what if they'd won? Like, how, how is that racial tension going to get resolved? Yeah. Um, season three. We'll find out. <laughs> uh, gentlemen. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know if you guys are ready for this episode of Journey Quest. What? Well, oh, I... if only we knew what had come before. Uh, the, 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 some form of, let's see, uh, last I remember, we were in the jungle. I had a stump. Uh, we uh, saw signs, one with the smiley emoji, one with the death, death looking head. And we decided to go to the smiley side. And uh, we showed up. What, uh, do you remember what? what folks were doing, Justin? Uh, I, I don't. I, I remember that uh, this is a very dense uh, forest and our monkey companion. Oh, no, no, no. I remember. We, we came upon uh, people that were, that were at, at work doing something, and while we were trying to just surveil them, our villainous monkey companion went over to alert the people of our presence, and now we are at their mercy. Uh, well, then let's, let's kick it off with our previously on... Previously on Johnny Quest is a very crudely painted emoji. The other sign, a scroll, skull and crossbones. Whoever it is that they're civilized enough to cook, maybe they'll be able to be reasoned with. Ryan, what could go wrong? We're being chased by a cybernetically enhanced lunatic. We've gone through at least three dimensions and, and uh, we got we got three arms and a dream. All right, so so if if the monkeys outed us, I mean, at this point, do we just throw our hands up and, and find out what they got to say? Where well, you got captured, and so you're in a hut, and uh, the leader of the group was walking into the hut where you are. Oh, that's right, that's right. And also, Brian, let's not get too cavalier about how many hands we're throwing up. Like, okay, all yeah. right, all right. <laughs> throw our hand in the air. Yeah. So uh, leader of the hut, leader of the tribe walks in there and you never quite saw you smelled the sound of roasty meat. You never quite saw what was on the other side of that row of people because uh, uh, mm. Bibu, your monkey companion, who uh, you really didn't you, you, you blamed and he's not a villain. I think he's very helpful, but you just, you know failed to give him the proper guidance instruction that he needed, you know, it's just trying to find some other friends. Hey, man, we get it. Yeah. A wrench is useless when you want to uh, 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 cook a meal. You know, it's it's wrong tool for the wrong job. Mm -hmm. Also, no, man. he's a bad guy. He's going to get us killed. Screw no, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm beyond Andrew's side here. Bebo's got, Bebo's, Bebo's got his merits. We just got to figure out what they are. Uh, I, hope, I, hope, I, I, hope, I hope you give him your other hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, leader of the tribe walks in there. Right. And he's, you know, looks kind of like a regular sort of dude, maybe, maybe late thirties, whatever. He's wearing a very tall stone, steel, stone, you know, one of those, what do they call them? Uh, steam pipe hats, whatever, stove you know, pipe? some yep. shells and yeah, stove top, whatever time. Stove top hat, stuffing. Big tall hat. 
Yeah, and he's got uh, some shells and stuff on it. You know, his clothes look like they're made from early, you know, older clothes, been tied together and woven together. So it's sort of a, it's a very artisanal culture. So hold hold on, uh, does it look as though these were recovered from other society? Because the, everything I'm picturing as i as I'm imagining uh, looking around is very, uh, uh, very subsistence farming. Uh, you know, uh, you know, isolated Stone Age stuff. Is that is that not the case? I mean, you see on his arm a tattoo that says the cake is a lie. So oh, you're like, geez. all right. It's hipsters, you know. damn it. Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah. So they're like, he's like, well, hey, dudes, what's going on? Uh, just. Hey. Hey, man. What's, uh, what's the haps? Just a couple of bros trying to hang out, right? Uh huh. Yeah, we uh, you kind of snuck up us on it there. You know, you got to be careful. That could that could really go south real, real fast. Ah, well, you know, that's just, just southern hospitality. A little courtesy for you. Whoa, what's with the stump? What's with the stump there, buddy? That yeah. looks like it's still bleeding. Yeah, funny story. I might I might currently need medical attention. You don't happen to have a healer or a witch doctor or or or, or, a, or, a, 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 or a health a bot doctor. Yeah, we could just start um, with regular doctors. No, no, I, I, I point my stump. Yeah. I, I, I hold my stump up as I stage whisper to Justin. I was like, I don't think they're very civilized. The best we can <laughs> hope for is a shaman. Uh, yeah. So you have like any kind of military doctor, you know, somebody that can uh, help my friend out. Dude, I'd love to help you out, but I lost my certification from the medical boards when they no longer had medical boards a couple of years ago. So I don't know if I'm really qualified able to handle that, and I don't know well, what your I, insurance situation yeah, is Yeah, but uh, also, I mean, let's it's just us. It's just us ladies here. Come on, it's like uh, you know, ain't no cops. I ain't no ain't no uh, doc cops around as far as I can see. Rules are rules, man. Okay, um, no. Rule of law. That's that's good. That's how did good. you the or end up without the hand? Uh, I, I, uh, you know, it's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, it was a, a, he, uh, accidentally, he hasn't had a hand since birth. He, he accidentally rubbed it on a rock. Uh, and that's why it's, uh, it's, it's bleeding, but we really do need somebody to, to, to take a look at it. We're just trying to, uh, survive this jungle. Mm hmm. Your story sounds a little bit fishy, gentlemen. A little bit fishy. Uh, That's yeah. right. We don't care. It's fine. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Uh, our peeps. Our hey, peeps. Hey, uh, Pedro, come in here, buddy. Uh, in walks another guy. He's got a medical kit. Like, yeah, go ahead. Just just stop him from bleeding all over the place. And they, they wrap your stump up like this. I, like, I, I, try, right, I, so, I try to, real quick, take a peek in his doctor's bag. Is there anything exotic in there that looks like it might be like a robot hand or something I can ask for? No, nope. there's like a Wii magazine from 1983. Ah, damn. Uh, although I ask, I ask, I ask, hey, can I borrow your Wii magazine from 1983? He closes the case, pushes it away, okay. and he gives you an eye, and then looks around. You weren't supposed to see that. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, uh, this is uh, the head of the tribe here talking. And uh, so, where are you from? What brought you here? What, what, what brought you about here? Uh, We're friend. You wouldn't believe us if we told you. We are podcasters from another dimension. Oh, hold on one second. I'll be right back. He gets up, just walks out in the middle of your talk. Uh, hey, I lean over. Justin, Justin, uh, maybe maybe before we say where we're from, let's find out where here is. I, I should, I, should we pretend like we know what's going on, or should we just explain that we're... I, I, I guess we should just tell them the truth. Pedro it? says, I think you guys should just explain everything. Oh, and also, if you want to have a private conversation, don't do it while I'm wrapping your hand. Okay, hey, Pedro, Pedro, well, while the boss is away, what can you tell us about this place? Uh, you know, it's, it's got its ups and its downs, you know, it's good, it's good, things are pretty cool here, okay, you no, know. Pe um, Pedro, do, do you know where Earth is? Pedro looks over at Justin. Um, your friend may have lost more blood than I realized. Uh, wait, wait, why is, why is that? Why are you asking me where Earth is? Where do you think we are? Okay. Okay, uh, cool. All right. Well, hey, listen. Yeah. Uh, uh, you got to understand, we've been on a long, strange trip here, and we've seen our, our entire families and friends all die. We've we've we we've, we've traversed things that that you would uh, make your make your hair stand up on end. I watched my fiance get devoured by a giant raccoon. Please go on. Tell me more. Oh, great. So, so you can relate. Um, we, we're, we're a bit adrift. Uh, we've been out of the loop for a bit. Do, uh, in sense of time, do you know when we are on Earth? 
Oh, gosh. Uh, I think it's Thursday. I got to check. I'm never good at that. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now, Pedro leans in really closely, starts to whisper, says, uh, whatever you do, when he asks you if you want to play UG, be sure to tell him. Hey, I'm back, guys, in Anwax, the tribal leader. By the way, I didn't my safe. My name is Phil. In his hand, he's actually got like a big meaty something he's chewing on it. It's smells fantastic though smells fantastic sorry we're stabbing our cook out here and i just wanted to get some before a guy called um so where were we you were uh you said you were some sort of myspace personalities or something oh, I, so, 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 so you've heard of myspace uh you you've you've heard of uh do you have the internet here i mean not presently no I mean, we'd need electricity first, and then maybe we could get the internet. Yeah, is that how so, it works? Yeah. So, wait, so, so, so you did have the internet at a certain point. Yes, I had the internet at a certain point when I lived in Portland. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, how did you get um, from Portland to here? I walked. So we're but anyhow, close to we're Portland. Not here to talk, <laughs> we're not here to talk about... Uh, me and how I got here. I want to talk about you, what you guys' intentions are here. Uh, listen, I'm not going to lie. We we were in an abusive relationship. We had uh, we had a, uh, a, a, a what we thought was a, a, a real partnership with someone, and it turns mm-hmm. out, uh, uh, yeah, you know the legend of uh, of, of Zuckerberg, right? Uh, we we got Zuckerberg. <laughs> Uh, got kicked mm. out. We co-founded a venture, and then uh, and now this guy's gone crazy. He's power mad. He's got more resources than you can matter, and he, and he's, he's he seems intent on stomping out the little guy. And when mm. and with us being the little guy, you know we don't like that. You know the way we tell the way we tell the legend is Zuckerberg. Actually, he was building something really cool, and somebody tried to sabotage it from within because they weren't getting what they thought was their fair share. And so in order to prevent that from happening again, he had to restructure in order to prevent that. Yeah, I, I, I think we both see it the same way. Uh, we, that, that's accurate. Hmm. Interesting. We, oh, oh, so good. Oh. You know, so what, I'm not a what, sauce hey, guy. Pal, a little bit of sauce is great. Pal, what is that what? that you're, uh, you're eating there? Oh, it's Ugg meat. Anyhow, um, uh, I shouldn't be eating in front of you. I'm sorry. I apologize. Let me just devour this. He finishes. It's fine. Looks his fingers. All right. Now, uh, here's what you need to know. If you're going to continue on your way, uh, this jungle has a name. It is the jungle of death. And that is because everything in this jungle will try to kill you. Uh, is there any exceptions to that? Um, presently, uh, not really. Uh, the only way that we were able to survive is we banded together which was hard because we went through kind of an early phase. It was really, we tried to do this sort of everybody, one voice, one vote, one person, one vote sort of thing. We tried to do everything by committee and we ended up having to kill half the people. Um, and then we kind of came, came to sort of consensus that a leadership was sort of the best policy. I know it sounds drastic, but me, those other guys, they were really, really annoying. Um, you ever lived in a commune? Not fun. Nothing yeah. got done. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, so, so when you got uh, you, you, you killed them. Um, is there a mass grave somewhere around here? You know, you're very focused on the past. Let's talk about the future. And what I want to talk about the future is that if you want to survive, you probably need to team up with us. You're free to go roam off into the jungle. Your chances of survival are slim and none. And I'm going to give you an example of some of the perils out there. Um, we have the raping spiders. I can tell you what they do. Oh, yeah. Uh, you oh, no, know. wait, the, the rapping spiders, like they, they, uh, like no, he said, he said, he said feet. raving, like, like they're, they're just insane no. and they got glow sticks. So imagine you're walking along and you see a little tiny spider web. You're like, oh, a spider web. And you go break the spider web. And then the next thing you know, you step into an almost invisible spider web and you try to move and you can't move. And then a, a large, large spider starts to trap you and wrap you up and cocoon you. But it's actually how it mates. Oh, dear. Okay. And it uh, can't yeah. see so well. And so it thinks you're another spider. <laughs> and then what it does, I can give you the details. No, it's fine. I think we get it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've got the uh, wrapping spider, and then what else? <laughs> yes. Uh, so we've got that. 
uh, we have the uh, the molesting sloths. <laughs> which... <laughs> oh, they take their time. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're cuddly at first, like, oh, that's really cool. And they're like, that was an inappropriate touch. Like, that's really, <laughs> and then you try to pull away, and then they get angry. They get really, really angry. Okay, uh, okay so so we get that the outside world's pretty bad. Uh, let's uh, let's blue sky this. Let's say we decided to join your gang. Uh, what, what would our responsibilities be? Well, it's not as easy as that, gentlemen. To be part of our tribe, to be part of the group here, we do have kind of an application process. Okay. And because uh, it's just, you know, it didn't work out with those other guys. Like, they were really jerks. So, um, basically, but it's simple. It's kind of fun. You know, like, like, you know, I used to actually, you know, before I got into, like, medical school, I used to work for a firm, and we did, you know, how do you inboarding? And we try to find out the best way is to sort of find out who's best for you or whatever. And we think gamification is really the way to do it. Really do games because they're team building. You figure out who's a good player, who's not. So we have a game called UG. Yeah. What is involved in UG? Well, also, there I, th- are a few I thought you were rules. eating UG. Is it a food or a game? Both. Oh, Justin, this sounds fun. Yeah. Uh, what are the details on UG? So, I can't give you all the explanation right away because that's part of the fun of the game. Is once you're into the game, because we don't have people going. I'm not going to sign up for it unless you tell me what it is. And then you're in the middle, like, no, I don't want to do a, you know, it's like going to an escape room with a friend who doesn't know what it is. And they're like, oh, we just got to stand here for 30 minutes. This is dumb. And you're like, you suck, Phil. And <laughs> you can't be our friend anymore. And why'd you move to Portland if you weren't going to be cool? And you should just go back to your magazine and your buddy Pedro and reading your Wii magazines. Okay. Man, uh, uh, that, that, that general anecdote uh, really does speak. To us about the importance because maybe somebody tell you what an escape room was but if they just told you beforehand we're gonna do this thing and just be cool with it if you were told to be cool then you would have been cool with it because you're a totally cool chill guy you still like surprises yeah listen uh phil i uh can we just trade uh, can we give you something of value and maybe take some 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 magic uh wrapping spider antidotes and be on our way or we're gonna have to play UG, aren't we, Justin? I think we're gonna have to play UG. I, I I look over at Pedro and uh, and I I raise an eyebrow and I and I try to like like and, and I nod slightly and then shake my head slightly like. Ch- 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 oh no, no, you no, you have to just go really slow. We are as you look at Pedro's face to yeah. see whether he's happy or sad, uh, or maybe and we are very interested in playing UG. Dot dot dot. Yeah. And then look at uh, Pedro. Do I get a read on on Pedro's reaction? Oh, uh, going to play. Pedro pulls out his copy of Wii magazine, although it's upside down, and pretends to read it and watches Phil. Uh, All right, All right Phil. Yeah. You want to know what? You made a real persuasive argument. I feel like we're a, we're we're we're, we're going to join. We're going. Well, this isn't no weird escape room moment. We're we're your boys, Phil. Let's play UG the best way it's ever been played. Yeah. Also, uh, on our adventures, we ran into all those jerks from that panic room. They're all dead now, or working at McDonald's. I'm glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. It's weird that you would know who they are, but I'm not gonna. I we, we know a lot of things, man. We're lost, mysterious travelers from another dimension. All yeah. right. Well, we got to go into the UG room. We're going to explain to you how you're going to play UG. And remember, you can't say no now. The penalty for, you know, leaving UG before UG starts is, well. You have to play UG. Ugly. (laughs) Wink. (laughs) Gotcha. So they gather up. You guys do get up. You're still being escorted. You walk out of the hut, and you still see the line of people, and you see the flames and the flickering smoke, and you smell just this delicious smell of meat. You're like, oh, it smells so good. So good. And and you guys are really, really hungry. 
Uh, man, you know what? I, I absentmindedly, I walk up and I'm like, and I'm like, uh, I point my stump right at the food and I'm like, I'm you like, you can't see, you don't know what they're eating, Brian. You see a crowd of people surrounding it. So. Uh, I, I wave my stump. I, 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 I hold my stump forward as if a, a magic wand to ward people away. I'm hoping that they'll be made uncomfortable by my stump. And, and I just kind of weave in cause I want to see, I want to see the food that smells so good. They're like, no, you gotta, you gotta play Ugg before you can have some Ugg. All right. Well, let's Ugg it up. Also, I asked right. really fast. Anybody have a hook or or, or, or a robotic hand? No. Um, Bibu the monkey comes walking up with a coconut with like a little twig sticking out of it. He tried to make you a little pirate hug. Oh, that's amazing! I yeah. give a big hug to Bebo, and I was like, "Thank you. Yeah. You're the best." And I put my stuff yeah. in, the, in the in the the nut. It's too big and it smells like rotting flesh. And you're like, yeah. And he's like so happy that you're wearing it. I, I put it on his ha- head like a hat. And I say, and that's for you. Grows buddy. back into the crowd and he comes back chewing on some meat <laughs> with some barbecue sauce. It looks a lot like blood just trickling down all over his fur. Uh, okay. All right. right. We're in the UG room. Let's go. Let's do they this. They take you to the UG room. They bring you into an UG room. They blindfold you. They sit you down inside of another hut, right? Yep. And you hear this voiceover say, you know, in the beginning, man was looking for ways to challenge himself. He invented games, tournaments, conquests from the era of Go, checkers, chess, Greco-Roman wrestling. Now we have achieved the greatest achievement ever in achievements. And it's totally cool to repeat yourself with adverbs and verbs and stuff here and now. It's totally cool. We do that all the time here. It's the thing we do. Um, to heck with MLA. Uh, <laughs> English is a living language. Uh, yeah. It's not weird for me to get so self-referential. That's a common mode of tra- of, tra- of of talking here. And yeah. who are you to judge our society anyway? Gentlemen, you are about to embark upon the greatest game ever, the game of UG. Blindfolds, please. And they whip off your blindfolds. And next time on Journey Quest. Yeah! Better be another trivia contest, or maybe it's Hearthstone with seashells. I think it's I think it's it's Beatles trivia. Mm. Beatles trivia, yes. So, uh, some picks, some picks. I got some picks. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna double down on my Snow Crash pick. Uh, it, it is really fun. It was fun when the Snow Crash came out to see this crazy few you know idea of what could happen in the future. Now we live in the future, and it's great to see. How right he got so much, and it's a lot of fun. You know, what's funny is if you go back to that Amazon page, I'm going to show you a very interesting trend. It is a great novel. I love Snow Crash. Everybody, I mean, it's four out of five stars solid. Now, when a group first finds a novel and tends to like it, often it's four and a half, five stars. Mm-hmm. But then when a book reaches outside of its sort of its Venn diagram of the intended audience, you will see this sort of thing where, like, great books, because it's like one of the best. It's, like it says there, like one of the top 100 best English language books and sci-fi novels and all that. You watch the sort of it surprised me too because I look at books I love that like why does this have four stars and not five you know or three and a half and not this and it's because when it expands into an other groups and other people are like oh you should read this and like who weren't naturally attracted to it yep who go man it's a lot of a lot of technical stuff and nerd stuff uh, you know I yeah. see that I see that happen in uh, on the Modern Rogue channel every so often we'll do something that that will get shared an awful lot and once it gets shared like you can tell because the uh, the ratio of likes to dislikes really goes to crap so it's like when when I'm sad when I see 99% likes because it means you know that we've only reached inside our bubble yeah I think it almost wonder if you want to have there should be some other system that say like of your cohort, which I know they try to do in like Netflix and stuff, but it's so opaque what's going on. And they got rid of like for some stuff, the star system, because like uh, a lot of their content just was not getting good reviews and they didn't want to look like it was just filled with junk stuff. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Um, Justin, you have a pick? Yeah, I watched this last night. Uh, it is the 2012 Steven Spielberg film, Catch Me If You Can. And I forgot how much I, sorry, 2002, not 2012. Uh, I forgot how much I really, really love this, uh, this, this, this movie, of course, based on the Frank Abagnale Jr. book, uh, which is in its own right, amazing. And everybody should, uh, read or listen to it, but, you know, just so well directed. And, and then the performances by, uh, 
by Leo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks and you know Christopher Walken are just just top notch. I just love it so much. It's a yeah. great book, and it's uh, the movie is pretty faithful to the book, and the book is a uh, is a true account. I mean, there there are some adjustments they have to make to make it a more human drama. Uh, you know, like the connection uh, between you know his his dad and so on. Um, but I thought I thought it was great. Uh, it's one of my favorite real life stories uh, of all time. Yeah, two things. One is in Abagnale now he lectures to like FBI groups. My brother heard him talk as an FBI agent, and so he would lecture to law enforcement. Because what makes him sort of interesting as a guy is this consummate con artist who started as a teenager. He's not a sociopath. He was not a so many of your con artists and people who do pull off those kind of levels really are career criminals and sociopaths. He really was just a very intelligent teenager who just sort of got away with it and got away with it and kept getting away with it until finally, you know, he kind of ran in and he didn't go back to that. And that makes his story fascinating. I was always fascinated by the idea of like, here's somebody who really didn't have, you know, wasn't a bad guy, was not a bad guy who did things. He wasn't doing things. Sometimes you hear these cases that sound like it. You find out like, yeah, and then they killed so-and-so to cover this up or then they threatened this person or whatever. And that's not his case. He was just a guy that just... You know, he counterfeited, he committed fraud, but he never did a violent thing to well, anybody else. Plus, also, he, uh, you know, he just took these outrageous risks and uh, spent so much of his time as an imposter that one of my favorite parts of the story is like he was trying to figure out uh, how to pretend to be a lawyer and then realized that in Virginia, as long as you pass the, the bar, you don't have to go to law school. So he's like, well, screw it. So he just read up and then <laughs> took the bar and passed it. So among his exploits, you know, he didn't even fake becoming a lawyer. He just became an actual lawyer. Amazing, amazing career life, and he could be a, he could be an HBO miniseries. To be honest with you, oh yeah, all oh, that stuff yeah. he did. I, I based my Damien Knight character in my uh, Angel Killer books largely on him. I did not know that, but now that you say that, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. There's a passing reference to Abagnale in there. The idea of like, because you know, the Damien Knight on one hand sounds like the sociopath and stuff, but like, well, but here's this other example of somebody who just says. I'm going to live outside the rules. I can get away with this stuff. And so as long as I can get away with it and really anything that caught him up was, you know, the counterfeiting, you know, because that we take serious. Yeah. Uh, pretending to be what? a doctor or whatever, if you're smart, you'll get away with it. So and really like he had clever solutions, but it's just the doing it more than once doing anything more than month yep. once creates a pattern. And it was the pattern that brought him down. Yeah. Uh, my pick, I've got two, I've got a recommendation and a pick. I got a recommendation and this might be kind of cool thing. I've been, uh, I mentioned this before, I've been div digging deep into learning coding and working on that. I got into iOS development, doing app development, and I talked a little bit about that last week. And and it's there's so many great resources now out there for learning anything and everything when it comes to Photoshop, when it comes to learning to program. It's it's I, I started a iOS course a week ago, and I've already been building my own apps, you know, and from, you know, a two-week span of, you, do a, you can just do a straight-up course and be doing something in a day. You know, but I want to get a deeper understanding. My point is, there's so many great resources out there for learning things right now. And one of the really good ones was that I actually did a course on this uh, on Lynda.com, which was an iOS course, which was really, really useful and very, very well explained. And those courses you'll find on Lynda on Lynda.com. Uh, I talked to a buddy who goes to like you know developers conferences and stuff. He says, yeah, you know the people who do those courses, they're the same people they have at conferences and stuff teaching you stuff. You know, if you want to learn how to do edit, you know, or if you want to learn to do visual effects and, you know, Adobe After Effects, some of the people who teach these courses professionally teach these things. And that's why some of them are extremely well presented. And that's the quality. Here's the cool tip. Many library systems have an agreement with lynda.com where you can log on to lynda.com for free and get complete access to the courses. I was about to go like, oh, let me go get a lynda.com subscription. I remembered somebody told me that, and then I checked, and I found out that my library card, I had an e-card version. I could use my library card, my part of my phone number, logged in, created an account, and had access to all of that stuff. So check with your local library and find out if you get free access to lynda.com. You'll find out that often libraries will subscribe to other services too, courses, certification training, things like that that are completely free. So um, – if you want to learn something, it is effectively free. Between what you can find on YouTube and if you want to look for some slightly more well-presented stuff like you might find on lynda.com where they'll have downloadable files, et cetera, there's just a lot of great, you know, a lot of great stuff there. It is – and I actually was uh, wrote an email to Matt Ridley about this. Um, we'll be seeing Wednesday, by the way. Um, and I said, you know, one of the things that I think that's an important thing about this age of abundance is just the fact that it's so easy to get training and to learn things now that the cost of learning stuff has fallen tremendously. Now the the cost of higher education has gone up in many cases, and that's an entirely different discussion of why that did. 
but the actual learning, the acquisition of skills has never been this easy and cheap. So that's my that's tip. That's awesome. That is a, that is a genuinely okay. sharp tip. Uh, that's now, my, other, my thing I've been playing with is um, – when I was a little boy, there was this TV show I watched, and I don't know, it was kind of very, very obscure. I had to watch it on public television. And there was this guy who was always kind of eccentric, but sometimes they changed up the actors on it. And he would go around and have adventures in time and space and protect humanity from there. And he used this device called uh, uh, a uh, ultrasonic Phillips. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sounds, sounds Memor- an awful lot like you're describing. Memory's hazy. Memory's hazy. Sure. Anyhow, as a kid, I thought, man, when I grow up, I want to have a pocket full of jelly babies, wear a long coat and a scarf and a big frizzy hair and carry a sound, carry around a, you know, a, a hypersonic Phillips head. Um, <laughs> I think that's what it was. But that day is today. And it turns out that show, I don't know if you ever heard of it, became a new, became, came back again. It's called Doctor Who. Whoa, get out. Never heard yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, a little obscure thing. Not a lot of people know about it. You should check it out. Anyhow, as a kid, I'm like, man, a sonic screwdriver would be really cool. A sonic screwdriver would be really cool. Now, I did get an iPhone. You know, I have an iPhone, which is a lot like a sonic screwdriver. You start thinking about the things you could do. But uh, I would like to say, man, I want a sonic screwdriver, something that looks like maybe could arguably be considered a sex toy on some streaming channel and get me banned. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> little in-house reference here. Uh, and uh, I finally decided uh, today is the day, and I bought one, and it's actually – this whoa uh you uh, audio listeners he's holding up what looks like i it, it i i don't even know how to describe it. It, it it is a uh to be honest it looks like a like a vape pen with a <laughs> with a with a circle cut out on one side That's right, Bri. it's a cannabis vape pen <laughs> <laughs> and and a single button if 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 the iphone was reimagined as a vape pen that could be hung up on a hook it would be this all right, well, you ready? I, I know, you I ready? know exactly what that is. That is uh, the new Amazon. I forget what it's called, but uh, it is Dash Wand. Part- oh yeah, the Dash Wand. Was that it? Yep, it's uh, Alexa it- in wand form. Whoa! Yes. And and it now, scans barcodes. So what it does is, I can scan barcodes. So if you're in your kitchen and you're like, "Man, I'm running out of noodle ramen," scan it adds it to your shopping list man i'm running out of this scan it adds it to your shopping list oh this um, seems basically dangerous. they turn me into a supermarket clerk in my own house but i can be like what time is it the time is 1 p.m so where do you love me there are people i admire and things i can't do without but i'm still trying to figure out human love <laughs> me too me uh, too <laughs> that is dangerous uh, i'm never going to the store again so it is what it is it's, it's an alexa wand it's a little handheld thing it's got a magnet that you put into your wi-fi it does many of the things that alexa does uh well, this is funny though um what can you do i can play music answer questions get the news and weather create to-do lists and much more okay play some music Amazon Music is not supported on this device. (laughs) (laughs) So what's cool about it, it's only 20 bucks. You get a $20 credit for like Amazon Fresh or something like that. I think I have enough Amazon Fresh credits for, you know, an attorney. But you get $20 credit, whatever. Um, But the point is, is like if you want just like a simple, not always on uh, Alexa, you can do this. It has like almost all anything. It's not going to do anything. It has to, it's going to stream continuously for, but a lot of other stuff that you need. Can you set an alarm? Can you set an alarm? Alarms are not currently supported okay, so, on this device. Uh, probably so good. it's very but much they, in beta. But, yeah, and, and so we'll see what I don't. I don't know if they will or what. What they will or will not support with that because. It's designed to be very, very simple, but it can do a lot of other stuff, like, what's the weather? Right now in Glendale, it's 86 degrees with clear skies and sun. Not in Glendale, but that's okay. Uh, point <laughs> is, it's a very interesting idea. You know, the idea of moving Alexa out into all these different things. Like, you, if you have an iPhone or an Android, you can have an Alexa inside of your app, and you can function Alexa there. And my Alexa dot keeps turning on every time I say her name, which we all know about. It's a very interesting little thing, but it's 20 bucks. It's just 20 bucks, and that's the power of, 
oh, we'll just create a bunch of these little magic buttons you press that do whatever you want. How amazing, how far we've come since the days of QCAT, uh, where the, <laughs> the that, that big pain in the butt uh, fiasco. Uh, and so, yet, but, structurally, this does what the QCAT was always imagined to be able to do, but, but it well, does it without any of the hangups. Well, the problem, so QCAT, for those who don't know, QCAT years ago was the idea of merchandisers. They wanted to create a, and they called it the cat because you could have a mouse, and they want to have this other thing you attach to your computer called a QCAT. And the, the, the vision was you'd have this thing that had a, had a little scanner on it, and that you could put in, like, not unlike, you know, the, the uh, QR codes and stuff that you could, skew, you could scan QCAT codes in a magazine. You'd be flipping through a magazine, and you'd see an ad for the new Ford Explorer. Like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let me take my QCAT, scan the QCAT code, and I can play an ad for the Ford thing. I mean, that was that was its general sort of push that they put it out there, which was dumb. It was dumb, <laughs> dumb, dumb. Every subscriber what? Wired magazine got one. And, it, well, and the uh, uh, yeah no there was uh, there was like a, it came in the newspaper for some regions they mm -hmm. spent they spent millions of dollars to send these out and then when nobody used them to buy stuff or look at ads or whatever and instead they they're like well this is a perfectly good IR reader uh, well, and they started hacking it. But that people started hacking it from the initially because they're like, well, I could use this to scan ISBNs, and it would not scan an ISBN code. It was designed; they didn't want it to do that. They wanted you to have you scan your own thing. And people are like, you sent me this thing for free. I'm going to hack it to make it do an ISBN code. And I think the QCAP people tried to fight this. Yeah, they did. And it and but they, they, it lost because like, uh, you gave these away to people for free. Nobody bought one or agreed into any sort of commercial you know transaction with this. You. Sorry, dudes. You know, if we throw this thing on your doorstep, you're like, well, I got to use for it. You know, yeah. and there's still, you know, an, an evolving poor form of law, which is still going on in the state to this day over that. But it was dumb because, yeah, because you you had to pay them to be able to create QCAT codes. You could create your own. It was just a dumb thing that didn't. You're like, well, why don't I use this as an existing barcode? No. If it did that, it still would have failed, but it would have been a more interesting failure. Yeah. Well, and the, the, I guess the whole positioning was um, get the customers to use the gizmo uh, and and get the companies to pay you to you know be the man in the middle perpetually and of course that kind of business often breaks down in an internet age where mm -hmm. uh, where you know we, we we don't like that. It was a you know it was publishing and advertising trying to figure out the internet and publishers were excited about it because they saw this as this bridge because they were fearful because magazine publishing which which was a long time ago much bigger was like well you know. How do we how do we get how do we make ourselves still relevant? Like, oh, what if we're you go through a magazine and you find something cool and then you can go to the web and it's like, or I just find everything on the web <laughs> and magazines become this anachronism and I'll read on the toilet until somebody invents an iPhone. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> and although, you know, it's funny, though, and I bring this up again from reading uh, Tim Wu's book, uh, the, uh, uh, the Attention, attention Merchants. Yeah. What's that? Or, uh, sorry, uh, I misremembered the title. Yeah. You know, that that. Uh, People magazine is still makes far more money in revenue than like BuzzFeed or other and any other like you know Huffington Post or whatever. Like People magazine's ad revenue is humongous compared to oh. just about any single. Uh, it's it's you know, fascinating. Web uh, it's fascinating how in the bubble we are with the internet because um, of course we announced last week the we, we are we are as of now five days away from Scam School being a TV show on the Science Channel and you would think Yay! that when I make that announcement on the Scam School channel everyone will be like oh that's great you're going to reach a lot of people and yet the perception is just like I don't know it seems like TV is just a step down to from the internet or from YouTube or whatever and uh, uh, and of course that's not true by the numbers TV is still the 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 ten thousand pound gorilla by the numbers most people watch television and most people watch appointment viewing they watch live they watch mm -hmm. just what happens to be on and yet because we live in this bubble we all think of of television and magazines as these quaint anachronisms but but that's definitely not the not the case yeah that is sure that is sure oh, um, uh, gentlemen. By, by, by the way uh, uh saturday morning saturday morning eight eastern five uh, uh west coast a.m a.m saturday morning on the science channel can't. Hell yeah. Set your DVRs right now. Set them. Set them, you filthy animals. Set my DVR to record Scam School on the Science Channel. Science Channel. Yes, Andrew. I will do that right away. <laughs> oh, right wow. Right That's amazing. Yay. Hey, wow. Amazing what technology can do. Yeah. Um, Alexa, it's been weird. Sorry. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs>
everybody's thing has just gone up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, like if I say, Alexa, play weird things. They used to like automatically to tune in would turn on and do that. Uh, uh, all right. I got to hit the bathroom. Yep, I I, I got to run, and uh, uh, I'm sorry I'm going to miss after things, but, right. uh, but you guys have a great time. Uh, good good show as always, man. Like, please. I'll be right back. Right. Uh, Bryce, uh, call me back, uh, or I'll call you. Let me uh, just turn this off and restart okay. the stream. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Oh, welcome back. Everybody left all at once. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Whew, it's a day. It's hot in here. I don't think the AC is on. Ah, you left. Hey, is the AC on? Uh, turned off. Uh, hello, everybody. Um... So we're in between the things right now. Uh, it'll be uh, Andrew and Juice, the Juice, Wheeze the Juice, etc., etc., etc. I won't say who, but somebody spilled beer on this mixing board, and now it's acting a little funny. The Juice is loose, indeed. Uh, everybody see the new, uh, Patreon, like, uh, uh, redesign? I think it's pretty sharp, though I think the logo is, uh, is weird. I like the, they kind of got a more muted orange theme. The, the, the new fonts are a little, a little nicer. Um, I think they updated the, some of the stuff on the, on the play graphics. Uh, I mean, it looks nice, but I think that... Patreon, um, that that Patreon logo is a little, is a little funky. It's a little, it's a little bit funky. Davey Course, the the logo looks like a game of pong. Yeah, so I saw someone was saying uh, supposedly it's supposed to represent like a um, like a quarter being put into a coin slot. Oh, he's back. So no, no, I mean, I can kind of see that, but it's also like, it, it is, it doesn't really look like a P anymore, so I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know. Oh, that's great, to the box. <laughs> Good um, Space NML, they seem embarrassed by it too because it's only visible at the footer. That's a good point. Oh, God. My new horror movie, Guy Who Stands There. <laughs> ah, do you hear that? Hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty weird, but also I don't think that, um, you know, that Patreon logo was super prom. I mean, I guess it might have been. A, it, no, yeah, it was. It used to be the the homepage, the home logo, but um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty weird thing. How you doing, Andrew? Good, sir. I've actually, you know, I've got my uh my iPad Pro. Is it um, is it what you're you're calling us in from now, or can we take a look at it? That's what I'm calling you in from. Okay. Um, I wonder if I can do a. Uh... Did we talk about the new iPad stuff that's in the next iOS? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Digital technology bringing us together in the new age. A little further down. Okay. Oh yeah. Look at those linens. What is that, 800 oh, yeah. count? <laughs> uh, this luxurious Ooh. bed. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> uh, let me double check and see if we got any questions. I don't think we did, though. Things. Uh, there you 
here he is. So, um, I, I would say with the Patreon redesign, I agree with you. I think that they were due for kind of a, 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 a big boy redesign because, uh, you know, the, the design had fairly been fairly unchanged since they were like running out of Jack Conti's apartment. Uh, uh, at, at least like visually, like they had a, they had that big, like re like that big old re layout of everything yeah. a few, I mean, what, six plus months ago, but, but yeah, even then it was still like a very, I don't know. I, I kind of did like how, how bright that orange was, but. Well, you know, I, I think part of it is also that, that things are kind of different for them and, and, and even knowing, uh, internally they kind of had to shift a little bit away from like, oh, here's a fun, funky, fresh way that you and all your cool friends on YouTube can make a little extra dough mm -hmm. to now it's like they're more of like a bank or a payroll company. You know, like they, they, for a lot of people, I mean, for me, you know, Patreon is my living. Right? right like that's that's how i make money so part of that design is now saying trust us you know as opposed to you know come fucks with us with two x's you know sure um space nml is pointing at pointing fun that they've got uh brand guidelines but like they've always had guidelines every company Every website you've ever heard of has guidelines for how to use their brands. Just most people don't need to look at it as much as they do. Yeah. I mean, YouTube has very specific brand guidelines that you're not supposed to fuck with, but everyone does. You know, they get published and they're very public. Patreon is uh, obviously a company that I have a tremendous amount of love and respect for. Um, and I think that they're like our, our days of Patreon, I mean, for us, Patreon is not under the radar, but I believe Patreon is going to face a very interesting next couple of years as more and more media becomes independently funded because there's nothing that the media likes to talk about than other shit that happens in the media. Sure. Yeah, it's... Yeah, like there, 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 there are a couple things that I don't even want to mention because I don't want to see them become a discussion that I, I can, you can see brewing on the horizon. Well, let me let me ask you a question though. Um, or maybe this should be our after things discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, hold on. Let me uh, let me grab my coffee and then we can rock right into it. Okay. Get Justin some coffee. <laughs> Amazon's choice for coffee is Folgers Classic Roast Ground Coffee, 30 mm, ounces. It's $7.49 plus tax. Would you like to buy it? No, I don't drink coffee. Yeah, what the fuck? What am I, at the airport? Folgers? Yeah. Jesus. I don't drink coffees, but I don't drink coffee. Uh, all right, Children's you're in a roll. <laughs> it is recommended a children's book called I Don't Drink Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> My balls itch. The top search result for balls. All right, I don't even want to hear. As future scary. <laughs> it's why I don't want to Google Google Home in my house. Yeah. No. <laughs> Bath bomb gift kit, three cents. <laughs> bath bomb. It's sixteen dollars and ninety nine cents plus tax. Would you like to buy it? No. All right, let's go. We got we got forty five minutes. That's all I can find for falsage right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can find for falsage right now. This <laughs> future is not what I expected. <laughs> but yet, it's everything you need. Yeah. All right. Ready. Uh, ready? Yeah. Take it away. In three, two. Welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by my co-host Justin Robert Young and my other co-host Bryce Castillo. Hello, yeah. Gentlemen. Yo. 
Uh, so, uh, uh, Bryce is always a part of this. And finally, now that we got rid of Brian, Bryce can be the real part, important part that he's always meant to be. Get rid of um, that guy. I know. Tell you what, a birthday present for Bryce, Brian, GTFO. <laughs> yeah. It's what a birthday way for present the real for star power. Um, so, uh, gentlemen, one of the things we were just talking about right before in the pre-show was, Patreon has done a they've done a redesign. They they they've stepped up their game. It looks a lot more uh trust us kind of thing cuz you know there is was pointed out, you know they they are they're getting bigger and for many people they are a primary source of income and so they're big into payments handling etc and so they're trying to look a little more responsible and stuff and not just this hey, wouldn't it be cool if your friends could support you and we'll facilitate that. It's it is an amazing fascinating model. Um, and one that I think is only going to grow and grow and grow. And I think it could potentially even surpass Kickstarter. Oh, I, I, I think without a doubt, uh, you were, you know, Patreon running at full strength should always, uh, uh, be able to overtake Kickstarter just because all you got to do is set something up once and it's there forever. And each time you want to set something else up, it's, it's another recurrent, uh, a revenue source. Uh, you know what, what? What Patreon has done, which is the most important thing, is is create themselves as a credible, trusted brand for people to give their money without thinking, which is not as easy as it sounds. Despite the fact that on the internet it's very you know easy to do it, but if you look at the brands, the emergent brands in which we like trust our money with. There's really not that many of them that are our household names. And and mm -hmm. you need that to be the case if it's Patreon, because now Patreon is just the shorthand of, oh, support creators, as opposed to a shady site that I have to give my credit card. Right. Or or it would have been like a, a PayPal. PayPal has always had a subscribe option for people to give you recurring payments for you yeah. to collect recurring things. But the the mixture of of payment processing for recurring event for recurring uh, billings and tools to tie that to creation is something I think people have uh, larger companies have been rolling out on their own for so long and and by Patreon opening it up you know at, at, to whatever fraction of the the horsepower that it is versus your your own rolled system uh, it's 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 huge, and it's uh, on this scale the first thing uh, for people who who are looking for this sort of support. Well, it, so much of it comes into the context in which we see things. Now, you know, ten years ago, you could you could pitch the idea of imagine. I got to sneeze. <laughs> Let's hit the edit button. Edit out. You know, ten years ago, if you're like, hey, imagine. You know, if I wanted to do a project and then I could do a thing where I could tell people like, hey, if I if I get this much money supporting it, I'll go ahead and I'll go do it. And you could pitch that and people would have been like, why don't you just create a page and just have people say they're going to they're agree to pledge to be able to do it if you do it. Like, well, then I got to collect and I got to do that. And you'd be like, well, you know, maybe there's a business there. Like, eh, I don't know. And, and, and it, but once you put in the context of Kickstarter, you're like, oh, I get this. Now I understand what this does. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's not a foreign th idea. It's just it's something that it only used to be for you know large companies to make. You know, Rooster Teeth rolls out their own sort of premium service. Giant Bomb has a premium service. You know, I mean that's what it is. Is it's like kind of democratizing a premium access to content in a way that YouTube has very much uh, dropped the ball on in in opening up those features. Yeah, I, certainly, certainly there have been subscription services for a long time, you know, but I guess that the context of this is sort of a, the idea is we're going to identify the relationship, but a lot of them are very impersonal. A lot of them, you know, we're going to identify the relationship that if you're a podcaster or, you know, YouTuber, you have a relationship with your audience and you don't think of yourself primarily as a content provider you think of a person doing something kind of cool that might be this, it might be that. Other services are – problem with other services, too, is they don't have the fulfillment thing necessarily tied into it. You can do an Amazon or you can do a PayPal reoccurring subscription. If you don't deliver, it keeps going through. Mm -hmm. And Patreon is saying, hey, yeah, no, here's the thing. If you don't deliver, it doesn't go through unless you're doing a monthly sort of thing. And that's so – you know, and that's where Kickstarter is like, yeah, no, we're going to be the intermediary. 
if it clicks over to here, then we'll do that. But then the problem Kickstarter had is, well, they didn't fulfill. And Kickstarter is like, well, that's technically not what our obligation is. And it's like, well, that's why I thought I was going to you. Mm-hmm. And that's been causing problems because, you know, it's not their they can't make sure they're going to fulfill on it. And they're trying to really hard on Kickstarter. They're spending a lot of effort into developing tools to help people deliver, to show people how to follow through, to help them build more realistic expectations, because that's the biggest thing impacting them. Yeah. For Patreon, imagine back in the day when we had, uh, you know, Whedon was doing um, Dr. Evil. You know, you could say, you know, you could do the Kickstarter Dr. model. We make, act, what's that? Dr. Horrible. Yeah, Dr. Horrible, not, sorry. Not, not the Thank you. I knew I knew it was getting settled out that long. <laughs> um, it was, uh, you could go in and you could do the Kickstarter model for that, but if you're like, oh, let's keep the show continuously going instead of having to do that that fundraise every year, 18 months, and then the time to go from there, you have this enthusiasm that says, all right, you know, we need to do an upfront, or we got this ongoing thing. As long as you keep doing this, we will keep doing episodes. And if we get a certain point, we can keep this going for a certain distance out. It might be hard with something as big as episodic television, but it's not impossible because that's kind of how things sort of work to a degree already. So the other thing that I think is is very important about Patreon is that it is not tied to a platform mm-hmm. that you know there was an undercurrent of it I think even when you know Conti as a YouTube creator that had done very well with Pomplamoose understood like you know uh, I mean I remember having conversations with people that worked at Google and 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 YouTube specifically where they were explaining the grand vision of just do content. We'll figure out the rest. We're going to sell the best ads. We're going to put them on there. You're going to get the number one, you know, uh, the amount of money that that you can possibly get. We're revolutionizing this. Uh, We provide the hosting. We provide your money. Like, this is it. YouTube, baby. And eventually, like all best laid plans you know you could kind of see the cracks in that the money wasn't quite what it was and it was often variable uh you couldn't really count on it and there really weren't a lot of metrics that showed you exactly uh what something would do you were kind of always just sort of throwing your project out in there into the ether and hoping that this time it would come back and also you know, then YouTube was like, yeah, well, also, you can't sell as many ads as you might want if you want to get our premium stuff. And, mm-hmm. you know, you just eventually start started to see where that was kind of not quite the bargain that they initially offered you. Same thing with Twitch. You know, Twitch, I think, has right now a better monetization model for live streaming specifically than YouTube has. But ultimately, I think there is a real buyer beware when anybody wants to base your entire way that you make money uh, uh, if you put it in the hands of a platform. And Patreon offers you that off-island experience where now all of a sudden we could not be on Twitch tomorrow. We could be on a new thing that, that benefits us. We could be on something else. We could do, hell, we were home-rolled forever, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and and we, we monetize on Patreon. Uh, that's huge. It's huge for the future of your show, and it's huge for for being able to actually make a living on it. You know, and it's it's a the problem with I think YouTube Red and some of those other systems is that they're recreating the problem of cable was in you know that we deal with in cable where you're, there's a huge inefficiency. You're paying a hundred dollar for a package, and you only want a few things. Netflix works great because Netflix says, you know, at nine bucks a month, we think we can create and we have if we have enough people, you know, the first million, the second million people watching Stranger Things doesn't cost us any more than the first million other than bandwidth. But production, the show doesn't get more expensive if there's two million people watching it versus one million. So they know that they can create a finite amount of product and they can increase their customer base to a certain limit and then spend a certain amount. The problem with these other platforms is they're, you know. When you're in YouTube Red, is yeah, you're you're going to get a percentage of something based upon some sort of metric or whatever, but you're fighting over a smaller percentage of what somebody's paying per month. Where the focus, I think, you're better off. Like case of Justin, is you're better off focusing like, hey, you know, I want to be the primary person to provide the content to my audience for these platforms, and so rather than say, hey, you got to go to YouTube Red to get me, just support me and I'll keep doing it because, you know, rather than you know, he'll make more money because somebody loves him and wants to get access to him. 
than he would if somebody loves him and says, well, I'll subscribe to YouTube Red just for Justin. Because, well, again, guess what? You're going to get a fraction of a tenth of a percent of that person subscribing to YouTube Red for you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, and that's it, it's, there, was, there was an article today about Spotify where, you know, the Spotify user base has exploded, uh, but their revenue, they're, they're losing more money than ever because they're still not making money on these people. Uh, and, mm -hmm. it, and it's the, the Spotify revenue system is the exact same that it is on YouTube Red is it's plays per this entire pool of revenue. And at at some point, that's that's a, that's a very small I you get you the fractions of cents that you can receive on Spotify will astound you. <laughs> yeah. And if I if I subscribe to Spotify because it's like, oh, Lord's got a new album out. I'm like, you know what? You know, maybe I'll just get go subscribe to Spotify and I pay, you know, whatever my 10 bucks, 15 bucks a month for it is. She's not going to see that 15 bucks, even though she was the reason I did that. And it's, you know, part of the problem we have is like, uh, you know, once you as people try to push somebody, you know, we've debated like, oh, should we sell Audible subscriptions or not? And the pro and con of it is it's like, well, you know, for what you're bringing to Audible, but, you know, what <laughs> one is our fans are probably heavily into audible, whatever, you know, for us making that trade off and pushing to that platform, they don't make that much, you know, it's like a one-time yeah. kind of thing yeah. yet for an audible, you know, new audible subscriber, it's worth, you know, $150 gross to audible or whatever. And you pushing those other platforms, it's like, yeah, I'll push people to the platform and then they're going to watch other content on that platform. And I'm not going to make the lion's share of what I should versus if I did my own Patreon or something like it. Yeah. I, I, I almost feel like YouTube was expecting more, more creators to push people to YouTube Red for that exact reason of like, hey, mm -hmm. if you get YouTube Red and you watch a lot of me, I'm going to see a lot of that. I'm going to see more shares of, of the, the revenue pot where, you know, something like Twitch, which is a direct a, a direct money uh, sort of sort of exchange. Yeah. You you know where your stuff is going. Um, you know, it's going directly to this person. You know how what percentage of it is going to that person. Yeah, uh, and every month you know that it's 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 just that directness that. Well, yeah, you you know that in in Patreon, you know you're creating your content for your Patreon supporters. Yeah. If you're on YouTube Red, you're still back in YouTube, and YouTube still has a problem. This we talk about this for years since YouTube launched. You know, is that you know how is YouTube going to monetize? And the only answer was going to be was going to be advertising. And people are like, oh, we don't want advertising on YouTube. Do you want to pay for it? No, then you're going to get advertising. But then they sort of reach this sort of ceiling limit to how many ads they can show you before you just say, I'm not even going to bother watching this. So that's they came up the YouTube Red subscription model because, like, well, there's some people really want – you know, they want to see PewDiePie. They want to see this sort of stuff. And it seemed like, oh, we'll be like a Netflix kind of thing. And I get I get pushed for YouTube Red all the time, like, you know, to, you know, like, yeah, get this. And it's like, it's nothing I want. You know, it's nothing I want. And it's not – not that it's a – there doesn't isn't a place for that, but – Here's my theory. Here's my guess, my prediction. Google slash YouTube is going to launch their own Patreon type system. A well, more formalized. Have, what's that? They Those, did launch something similar like two years ago, right? Yeah, there are. They it, have a lot of these systems in place for buying it, content, premium things, but it's I, only for. They get it people. wrong. They always miss the important part of it, though. You know, they always miss some part of it. And I'm like, yeah, they've tried different kind of like subscription things, but they haven't had. And I'm not saying it'll work, but I'm saying it's like the, it, it's it's like the part is missing kind of thing. You know, it's like oh, we're going to launch Google Plus. Okay, Facebook was based upon starting around the nucleus of communities of people who actually know each other, either from school or work. What's yours? People you know online. Well, great, that's everybody. So who's in my Google Plus? Everybody. I still get Google. I still get pushes from people in Google Plus. I don't even like. Not that I'm indifferent to like. Oh, so and so read this. I could get the. Yeah, I could care less. It's become a it went from a oh, this would be cool to like, oh, this is sort of useless to like, oh, this is negative. This is a negative experience for me. Yeah. Um, where and I think that I think that they're going to not to say they'll do it right or get it right. But I'm sure and again, man, do you know how many times Google tried video in selling video? Like I remember I bought videos from the Google store that no longer work. They shut that down and they keep trying it. But as more people start going to Patreon, that's that's their turf. So I let me ask saying. you guys some questions about Patreon, because what I mentioned before is that Patreon is going to is coming of age. I think their redesign partly reflects that uh, they I've had conversations with people there internally where they've talked about, you know, now it is easier to turn off 
what you're uh, what you're making, you know, because yep. you realize that this was something that uh, bigger players don't want you to see yep. exactly what uh, what how much you're making, because sometimes it, it gets to a point where it becomes detrimental. They, they now have a more professional look to them. I think we've already seen a little bit of it, but now they're going to have to make some very interesting decisions on exactly what kind of content is going to be allowed on there. I think that, that we are not far away from people directly attacking, uh, you know, on more controversial uh, shows people attacking Patreon for allowing them to be monetized because this will be the most direct way that you can, you know, instead of going to an advertiser and saying, why is this advertiser doing this? You can go right to the heart of the matter and go after Patreon and Patreon's going to have to make like decisions really hard, possibly well, unpopular decisions. Sure. And I, I, I guess it may be my naivete, but a lot of times they'll be like, we'll, we'll have this problem. Like, yeah, but that's going to be such a minor. Yes. That'll be a question that people say because it's something to say or talk about, but it'll continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, if if I believe what people said about the problems of PayPal, nobody would use PayPal. It wouldn't be the giant that it was. And I, again, I have problems with PayPal. There are frustrating things about PayPal, but it did what it did well enough and it was the best solution. It was like, great, what am I going to use instead? You know, and it wasn't until right. we had a big change with things like Stripe and other things, which made it easier to create online payments. It was like, and I'd have people like, Oh no, I don't use PayPal because you know they hold they'll, they'll hold you know they'll held sellers money for over these issues. Like yeah, they try to be very buyer proactive, um, and yeah. And, but you talk to some people and you think oh that's all the noise it's going to fail. You're like no, it's yeah. There are people who are very frustrated by that, but it still has so much utility to it. It still ends up succeeding. Oh yeah, no, I mean no. I, I I I guess I think that the thing that will be more of a, a, a an issue for them is just their own success. The fact that they are becoming synonymous with how you can make money independently online. And mm -hmm. since they are, you know, you got a big number there and you, you have, you know, have as many backers, even the ones that don't have their total money coming in, uh, you can still fairly accurately extrapolate, you know, uh, around what they're making. Mm -hmm. And so if you hate something or believe that something is, is, awful you can say all right well uh, let me let me attack that but now i know that that if, if that goes away or if they patreon decides that this kind of thing we don't want to be a part of now all of a sudden you're you know exactly how much you know you're taking off that table so i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you why i i love patreon though uh and I launched uh, a couple months ago with my buddy Jordan Gold. We launched a little a little magic podcast called Magic Club, right? And it's a companion pod. We do a podcast. We talk about magic. Then we have a companion session called The Secret Session where we do some really cool behind the scenes, learn some really cool slides. We spend a half hour, 45 minutes just showing different stuff and teaching. You know, Jordan teaching me or me showing something. We're bringing in people. We've had just great, um, you know, a number of the guys consulting for David Blaine have been on there teaching stuff. And yeah. our, our, we've just been doing this in a very slow rollout. I don't talk about it a lot. I don't promote it on my Twitter because we're just sort of we're building up, you know, content. We're building up, just finding our pace and doing this. And it's fun to do. We just do it because we talk a lot about magic and stuff. And so, you know, we're only making like on, on the the Patreon's only like sixty six bucks or something right now per episode, which is actually great because the funny thing is. I don't promote the I don't promote the YouTube stream or anything else on my Twitter. I have not turned that on yet because I'm still waiting to kind of get to where I think this is the show is still very much in beta for me. We have like maybe only a hundred views per video. We only got about a hundred views per video, but we're already at sixty six bucks per episode. Yeah. So you think about that the 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 ratio of viewers to monetization is insane, and, and not that that's going to scale like that, but that's what it means when you have like a hundred people who really like something that you're doing. That, you know, we're able to get, you know, we're making 80 cents per view or something. Or, I mean, it's just it's just amazing, you know, that, that you look at like that's the power of, an, of a devoted small audience that likes what you do. And that's why we're like trying to grow this out as a community. We're not we're not trying to do like get everybody on YouTube to watch this sort of thing. We want to we want to kind of just reach out magic, magic hobbyists and sort of find people that way. And that's, but, you know, it's, yeah. You know, but and, and that's that's a thing that that is the big thing that Patreon for a long time was was serving 
where YouTube and, and Twitch until recently w w were not of like uh, opening opening up those uh, opening up those revenue streams to smaller crowds, smaller groups uh, who have their own loyal, dedicated fans, but they're not, you know, big whales, right? Like you don't have to be a YouTube partner to start making money on a, on a small new channel. You don't need to be at a certain size for Twitch to get access to all their monetization stuff. Like you, um, it's, it's, it's opening up the doors to everybody. Um, and, and I think that's why it's, it's been such a, such a hit. And we've had, uh, you know, I've had conversations with Jordan's girlfriend. She's super knowledgeable about like on digital marketing and YouTube optimization and stuff and working YouTubers and all that. And our con I mean, the thing we've said is like, here's the thing that what we're trying to do is we're not trying to put this out there as a YouTube platform. Our goal is not to like, hey, we're going to find all these people on YouTube to watch us, which is what you want to do if you want to make your money through YouTube is what you do. It's like, like, no, our goal is to we want our primary source of people to come from you know, the magic community and, and people like, well, what, what would it matter if you just reached YouTubers first? It's because that'll shape the content. Mm -hmm. And if we're trying to do the mass appeal sort of content relates to magic, we're going to do what everybody else is doing, which is either exposure stuff or do a, 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 a knockoff, not good version of scam school. So, you know, where we want to go, we want to go in depth, which means the average YouTube watcher is not going to get this or want to be part of it. But somebody who's active on magic message boards or places like that is going to be hyper into that. And we know there are hundreds of thousands of people like that. So we want to reach those hundred thousand and not a billion people. So, yeah. So, so like five, let's say like five or maybe 10 years from now, what is what is something like Patreon look like? Is it is, is does Patreon get bought by somebody um, or does it does it just continue to be its own independent thing? We we just saw with all this re the redesign stuff that they were launching uh, a partnership for live streaming with uh, uh, Crowdcast um, mm -hmm. to 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 you know go into that that area more. And it's you know the thing that that Patreon right now doesn't have is hosting for stuff that is in audio or or images. Uh, I I I think that I think that. Uh, that's a very i think the better tools for content creation is helpful youtube content creation tools still suck because mm -hmm. youtube realized we could have crap tools but people will still keep creating and uploading it was almost like it was a limiter it's almost it was almost a way to say let's let's stop people from putting up too much stuff in there and so you still don't have there's still not a good you know interface on youtube just to do a, a regular podcast record it to youtube and edit it and have it work in a good way and not this the way they have it is sucks, and we're yeah. so far beyond that technology now. Uh, better tools for content creation would be great. Better ways to streamline it, and then you could take a bigger percentage. I think would be helpful for that. So many Mana says, you know, Amazon buys them. I don't see PayPal buying them, but Amazon buying them, 100%. Think this would be a thing that could be a fit for Amazon. What I would like to see, and I think that there's another opportunity out there, is. Uh, if you wanted to create a competitor to Patreon, if you wanted to create a, a way to, to solve a problem, the biggest problem with Patreon right now is if you're subscribing to multiple podcasts, and this is a perceptual point of view, at the end of the month or the start of the month, you get that you know $100 Patreon bill. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, ah, you know, $40 and then you're less a month for everything. Yeah, you, you, you start to question like, you know, it's, a li it's little bits here and there, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, $30, $40 a month for... Very mild to use. I, that, that's that. That's I, why anybody who runs a Patreon knows that first of the month, like uh, you, you normally see a dip, and it's usually because everybody gets that bill, and they're like, "Oh Jesus, I gotta, I gotta trim my hedges." And it's 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 that's that's probably the most the toughest part of the Patreon experience as a supporter is like having to decide. Oh man, I love all of these things. Which one? Which one gets the axe? So yeah. this is not. This is a little gray area. Mm -hmm. But the solution to that is either Patreon or somebody else says. In where Patreon works is they save on credit card transactions as they group them all together, and that's why you used to be able to do like one cent charges or whatever because they figured you know, which I think I thought that was a great idea. The, the one penny thing. I wish they'd bring that back because that one penny is a great way for me to email and stay in contact with people and let them know that and get them to at least get into the system. And well, I think that was. Uh, I think Patreon replaced that with the following system, where if, as long as you have public posts, you can still receive emails. Yeah, about it just doesn't. As... The, the the problem is, is that they're no longer in the system with their credit card or all that. 
you know, it's, it's, it's harder to get them to the jump as to a subscriber level, you know? Um, Possibly. You know, and, and it's a way to say to dial back, like, hey, I have trouble, just dial back and keep in touch. And so that's the way I look at it. Um, uh, the other the thing I was getting to, though, is that either Patreon or somebody else roll out a solution that says, hey, you're going to get billed individually. You're going to get, you know, you're going to, your bill's going to say the Justin Robert Young podcast, you know, the Bryce show, whatever, which if you see it for you're getting a $6 bill, $6 a month for that, then you're going to feel a little bit. You know, like, okay, yeah, no, I like that. I like the show. And then you know when to time your content, whatever. So, hmm. yeah, I'll tell you what, I, I would almost wonder whether or not it's better to just rip the band aid off all at once uh, or, or do it slowly, you know, because uh, I, I, if I got 40 statements uh, about like the, the, the smaller numbers, whether or not I would think that that was better or worse than just the one where I'm like, I mean, like I, I can rationalize it because I'm like, oh, look, I'm I'm supporting other people, and you know, this is a professional business relationship that I'm I'm keeping everybody in in my good graces because I want to support them and put my money where my mouth is if I'm asking people to support me. Uh, but I mean, even me, I look at that number and I'm like, oh, geez, all right, let's let's see where we can save a little well and talking about patreon uh bundling up transactions you know they do it so that it's cheaper but if mm -hmm. if suddenly everybody has their own s statement and and uh maybe it, i think it would be who patreon at some point to figure out a way to make it economical to have people have custom bill dates and so if you don't mm -hmm. if you suddenly don't have everyone billing on the the end of the last day of the month or the first day of the month then you you can spread out some of that 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 shell shock um, across, them. but then that gets expensive because you're charging smaller amounts all throughout the month. Um, you know there there are uh, uh, systems in place like uh, PayPal has adaptive payments, and they actually have a thing for micro payments for like things under five bucks actually makes sense because then it's like the five five cents plus five. Like it's five cents plus I forget what the, the fee is, whatever. But like you can do dollar payments or whatever like that, and not have to do the thirty cents, you know. So there's a point threshold there. Mana says he thinks they can PayPal as a potential buyer. I would say that yes, it would be seem like they're a fit from a a uh, uh, point of view of they're into payments and stuff. But PayPal itself is a company in their acquisitions and stuff they've been doing is they you know they've acquired uh, BrainTree. Something's been zero, whatever, and all that. They've they've acquired other companies that do really, really good at sort of um, payment processing. But Patreon is very much a social media thing too. You know, yeah. they're very much a. It's another component. Not to say that they couldn't do it or they wouldn't do it, but it's just been so outside of their wheelhouse of what they did. And you know, the 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 long history of of PayPal. You know, going from individual to bought by eBay to spun out and all that is interesting. Now they're. You know, PayPal's got a market cap of sixty-three billion, so they could certainly afford to do an acquisition, and it would be an interesting play to see they do it. But they buy those other things like Braintree and stuff because they've been so bad at redoing their code in house. That is, you know, I've gone through their back end adaptive payment systems, and their code, some of their tutorials or the explanations are wrong. They're actually incorrect. That's not how you do it. They don't know how the stuff, the system works. Elon Musk has said, you know. He's actually there are still bits of his code that he originally wrote back in the '90s that's still in there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, we'll is, is the future of Patreon like kind of a mini bank? Like, are you know, are, are they like, like get, moving money around? Well, and also loans to creators, or or oh. or do things where you're buying and you're buying certain equipment or something at a, at a I certain hope level. Not. You're, I, I I think that that gets into such. It, I think that gets into a very problematic area, and I think that I think that what they do best is they make it very easy. Right, now, they make it very easy. To go here to pay me money, and then you know you will get your content because you'll get emailed. This is the content. You know they're very good at that delivery for content and fulfilling that promise. So I mean, what they do, what they do with creators in the back end, maybe. But I mean, that gets into such a, a crazy stray area. But if they say, hey, you know. They make how do they make their money? They make their money by people going to Patreon and using that as a service to get things from people they love. So they want to get more people from YouTube and other places into Patreon, bringing their fans there. How do we do that? 
we'll make a better tool for you to do this than YouTube. We'll make a better experience for your fans than YouTube does, which they do already. You know, I love, you know, the patreon.com slash magic club page is a lot easier to look at than my YouTube channel page, which is just garbage. It's just, you know, a billion different committees trying to tell people what they should have here, here and here. And it's ugly and it doesn't serve my purposes. It doesn't make me money. It doesn't do what I want it to do. So I think that, you know, they're, they're the value proposition is like, we're, we solve the problem. Tell your fans to go here to subscribe. We'll make better tools for you to create content and better tools distributed. Uh, I, I think, let me just say this, uh, their RSS manager, the fact that it is just drag and drop, or sorry, it is, uh, mm-hmm. well, drag and drop to upload uh, uh, audio to them. It, it's, it's simple. It is mm-hmm. a, as clean as an interface as you can find. And you can so easily just say this only goes to certain mm-hmm. patrons or, or it's public. Like, that's, I mean, that, you know, we, we, I, my, my Patreons jumped, I think, like $300 or something in the last, like, month. And that is all because of that functionality that, that Patreon built in there. You can tell because it is a tool made by people that had a problem they were trying to solve. You, they yeah. had a problem they were trying to solve, and how do you, you know, and you could, you look at that and you know, this guy, they knew what I was going through as a creator. What do I need to put stuff? You use other systems like, yeah, go over here, enter this form here, but I'm like, who, who designed this? Who do you, who do you think is using this? It's, and it's, uh, well, and you can you tell know. they went the long way around it because it's not using RSS with credentials, which, which mm-hmm. you normally had to do for premium or pay RSS feeds. They are going through and making unique tokens for every user so that mm-hmm. on the user side, it's super easy. And on the creator side, they don't have to do anything dealing with passwords and, and login mm-hmm. and stuff. It's, it's, yeah. it's, I, yeah. I, I didn't expect them to, to, to do it. It was smarter way. and you don't even think about it, you know, and I, I think that that's, and that, that's a thing to think about is that if you want to create something, look at your own use cases, you know. Mark Zuckerberg, you know, wanted to create a better way to talk to people and inter- inter- interact, wanted to make money, you know, but he wanted to create a, he was a guy who was at college using services. He thought they all sucked and thought he could do a better job. So he created a better tool for him. Mm-hmm. You know, YouTube was initially started by people who were like, man, I just shot some video of this thing. Where do I put it? And like, oh, I can go here and I can pay this month a month, this much a month for an account or I could do this or whatever. And the problem was, is YouTube sto- storage and streaming was still ridiculously expensive, but it was, hey, so there was a, period in which you could get, you know, it was 2005, whatever, there's VC money back in that you could get VC money to go fund something and say, hey, can we get a few million dollars to keep this thing running until we scale it? And it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and kept losing money and it may still lose money. But my point was, and when it first started, it was a very easy to use tool, but that was 2006, you know, Um, and now pre iPhone, pre everything. And, you know, it's usable, it's easier, but it's not as friendly as let's say patreon is which says this is what we do so yeah they talk about acquisitions and stuff like you know what about apple buying them or whatever it's like you know anything's possible but you have to look at like what an intelligent buy is a company going to their core strength amazon bought there's buying whole foods because amazon wants to sell you stuff and when we've talked about amazon stores before it was always the idea of like oh are they going to replace barnes and noble are they going to replace best buy or whatever, and I've always been sort of not so much into that idea because those are extremely inefficient stores. Little kiosk stores, little small stores that show off Amazon wares that just run basically barely break even, that's different. They don't make the revenue. The people are like, oh, there are 10 Amazon stores. Like, yeah, what's their, what's their revenue per square foot compared to an Apple store? Mm-hmm. Laughable. But Amazon buying Whole Foods is great because everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got to buy groceries, and they can figure out the efficiencies, and Amazon's like, well, we can tie this into our services, and it's already a profitable business, and grocery stores aren't going away, but we're ahead of the curve of where that could be. Um, Amazon buying you know, a company like Patreon are starting their own. I put that at highly credible. You know, they bought Twitch because they said, man, if we, were, if we were the size we were now, we would have bought YouTube. Um, but Twitch well, came I, along, I, and so they said, well, what's that? You know, to read the tea leaves, they bought Twitch – right out from under Google by offering them basically freedom to do what they wanted, uh, Mm -hmm. but all the benefits of what they were going to get from Google, like all the benefits of space and, uh, you know, all the, all the bandwidth and everything. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, you know, we can just run it on. I mean, they're probably, I think they were already running on AWS. So it's like, Mm -hmm. 
just look at that, you know, like, like you can just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, that was a, uh, and I think a smart move because the problem with Google is, you know, the Google track record would be, Hey, we'll try to do this thing. We'll do this. And like, yeah, now we're going to fold this into YouTube, but now it's going to become part of the whole YouTube thing. And I think it would have sucked. Well, and also automation, you know, there's still parts of Twitch that are very like human centric and creator centric. And mm -hmm. you see YouTube, which, which has a, a support system for their high, their highest level creators and channels. But, you know, if you're anything less than that, you know, you're kind of, you are you are graced to continue to use it for free um mm -hmm. and I, I i i don't know that i could see stuff like the amount of partner support that twitch has right now or even things like the affiliates which are basically for anybody uh yeah come through yeah, in, outside of an amazon uh obviously i have a biased uh a biased outlook uh when it comes to twitch but i don't think that it's really arguable that uh, YouTube, Google as a company and YouTube as a subsidiary of Google, they don't like customer service. They don't, they, no. they believe that it is a, a flaw in humanity that they hope to algorithm out. Uh, and well, and it, uh, uh, yeah, and we talk about this because you're not their customer. Yeah. You know, if you're, you're, you know, if you're a watcher, you're somebody's attention to be resold to somewhere else, and that's not a model they really get. And even, you know, and that's when they and that's that I've always said that when Google said like, oh, or you know, when they tried to do their movie service and even like YouTube Red, like Google's been the company that gives you things for free, you know, for free. And, you know, when they launched Android, well, it's this free operating system. You got to buy a phone, but we're going to make this freely available and getting people to buy things. You know, I don't I, I would have, I don't know if it's where it is right now, but for the longest time, you know, the app store and Apple was still making way more money than the Google store, even though. You know, when Google, there were more Android users than iPhone users because, you know, it's just a, a different relationship between that. And I think that, you know, you know, the Google way is to pull something, you know, name a Google acquisition that retained its identity, you know, and it's hard versus, you know, you can start naming companies. Then you go, you know, think Audible. We talk about Audible all the time. Who are we talking about? When we talk about Audible. It's Amazon. Yeah, it's Amazon. You know, you take Goodreads. Amazon bought the biggest user book review platform there is. IMDb. You go to the Goodreads. What's that? IMDb is Amazon. Yeah, Amazon too. And you go to Goodreads, and you will not on there about Goodreads and all that. They'll talk to you who runs it. They will not tell you it's an Amazon company, but it's an Amazon company. And they've been very, very good at a number of these acquisitions that just, you know, are very, very strategic about this. And, you know, we talk about, you know, AWS, for many people, they're not even aware of the fact of, how much stuff just runs off of Amazon services and things to the point that I started playing on some of the Google services because Google's trying to play catch up there. Like they've tried to come up with their own competitor with buckets and systems for serving content. And the advantage they have is AWS is, you know, 10 to 12 years old when you look at those interfaces and the Google stuff is new and is a little bit slicker. But man, Amazon kind of there. By the way, for the so. record, uh, App Annie. Uh, which tracks this stuff uh, is reporting that only this year, 2017, will Android's uh, Google Play Store revenue overtake Apple's, uh, and wow. and they and this is like year what six or seven of of there being far more Androids out in the market than uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, than, at than least OS devices, at least yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a uh, you know, and that's been. You know, for the longest time, you know, it's like you did iPhone first and iPhone first. And that's why you look, Apple is now working really hard to make their their user tools and all that even easier to use. They've been doing a lot to try to get people to learn Swift, et cetera. Although I've heard there's now talk about, you know, using Swift to make Android apps. So, yeah. You know, oh, no, for open sure. source. Maybe. So what a world, what a world. Uh, gentlemen, this has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, no, it's an RIP Apple. Oh, don't even... Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think they're fine. I mean, again, they're actually making money on their phone sales, which is another thing that, that does not necessarily happen with uh, a, a lot of the other. I mean, like yeah, Samsung makes it. The app, the app store is like, yeah, it's a little thing we do on a side thing. And again, they have to innovate and stuff. And I, the, I'm not terribly excited about you know, the HomePod because I think Alexa won. Uh, they made the, you know Amazon has a plat Amazon has a platform they can push everywhere because they can say yeah we can put it on a we can put this on a twenty dollar device Apple's never going to do this They're never, whether or no. not you know 
you could be like, well, you know, people are like, what about Apple cars and things like that? Maybe, 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 maybe not. But when you are, your, you know, Apple, you have to understand Apple's stock value, Apple's market cap is $763 billion. $763 billion. Now, Google is at, you know, $668 billion and is, is hot on their tail. You know, but when you're when you're a company that's worth almost a trillion dollars, um, you can do things like take over entire sectors like energy sectors or computation or things like that. So, you know, you can you can spend billions of dollars exploring things like self-driving cars or automation. The, the, the most the most profitable areas of the future, we don't even know what they are yet. Yeah, no. So, uh well yeah uh, nobody cry for cupertino i think they're gonna Not be yet. i think they're yeah. gonna be just fine yeah they can afford to make a lot of mistakes um yeah. so can google you know google was betting everything on google plus that was the mantra inside google was google plus or fa- this, is, this is this is our live or die because they're like you know we're gonna face this problem facebook if we don't do this then we're gonna lose and we got to do it and then it's like google plus like yeah you know that was sort of yeah. thing uh, you know, all right, guys, I got to uh, let you go here, but I love you. We got to go. So- Goodbye. It's been after. Bye. Bye. Shut up. Cool. Good show. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me save on this. Pause. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out and watching Weird Things and After Things. Stay tuned. In about two hours, we're going to come back with crod killers we're gonna kill all those crods uh funny thing in the discussion thing is talking about how you know microsoft has their azure azure services for like their competitor to aws and google and how it's 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 actually kind of like more expensive and stuff right um and the problem is is that uh in my theory is me talking i don't think microsoft knows how to make run something as efficiently as amazon or google does because microsoft it has not been built toward that kind of efficiency. It's been built on selling inefficiencies to companies and stuff. Yeah. Um, they, they, they're not, you know, you can software is easy. You just make a bunch of copies. Well, when you have to build huge server farms to do all this sort of stuff, Google and Amazon have spent a lot of time in trying to figure out how to do super, super cheap redundancy and stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, Anyhow. we'll see. Um, all right, buddy. All right. We'll talk to you later, Andrew. Bye. Have a good day. Yes, the day starts now. <laughs> you hear that? Someone spilled beer on my mixer. All right, you guys. Oh, I didn't switch the thing for after things. God damn it! All right. Well, you guys have a good night. We'll see you in a couple hours for Kurt Killers.